Good morning, Avi. Hi, good morning, Hi, Prasad. Thank you. Thanks for organizing it and for the invitation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Yaman sir. Hi, very good morning to you, Vara. Morning, sir. Hi, good morning. Hi, Gaurang. How are you, sir? Hi, Evelyn. Hi. I would request everybody to come online for just one second so we can have a photograph together before the session starts. So just on the video, please. Yes, sir. Yes. James is signed off. Ah, he might join again. Yeah, he's joining. Morning, Dr. Steven. Hi. I think good evening. Are you still in USA or came back? No, back in Singapore. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Come be in US for time. Hi, Ashwin. Hi. 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 I'm also just uh, John, you were yeah. for a photograph. Uh, Far Prasad, can you hear me? Okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Far Prasad, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I seem yeah. to have just lost my um. Your voice is clear. No problem, James. Okay, fine. Good morning, Ashwin. Good morning. Good morning. Eman sir, can you switch off? Switch on your video. Uh, sir is busy in a session. Yeah, another session, I think. Okay, you take a photograph and then we'll start. It's already. I have taken. I have taken. We can start, sir. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the first uh, educational webinar from the Educational Committee of AOCR. And uh, uh, I welcome Education Committee Chairman Dr. Hemant Patel and also President of AOCR Dr. Evelyn to this uh, webinar. And I thank them for giving this opportunity today. And I also thank the esteemed speakers from various countries of the Asia and the UK uh, for joining this webinar and making this webinar a uh, reality today. Uh, without much delay, I'll hand off the session to Dr. Goran to proceed. Thank you so much, uh, Vara Prasad, sir. Um, I welcome one and all uh, for this wonderful session on uh, MSK Imaging uh, by AOSR. The MSK Imaging webinar uh, has lectures from eminent speakers across the globe. Um, and it is aimed to update the practical aspects of common imaging topics of MSK. We all know MSK Imaging, musculoskeletal imaging is one of the most sought after uh, subspecialities in radiology. And we are really thrilled to have uh, such a wonderful area of speakers. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Evelyn Ho, Madam, who is the president of AOSR, uh, for a welcome note today. Thank you, Garang and Vara Prasad. Happy Father's Day, first of all, to all who are dads, uncles, granddads, <laughs> godfathers, and the list goes on. And welcome everyone to the first AOSR one and fully interpretive content webinar. Prior to this, we had non-interpretive non but important topics of MR safety series and AI in research and healthcare. Now there are about 600 muscles in the human body and in infants, about 270 to 300 bones, some of which fuse by adulthood, leaving us with 206 to 213 bones and typically, we quote 206 bones. Now, the variability is because some of us have varying number of ribs, vertebrae, and digits. For the lean adult, bone is about 15% of body weight, while for women, is 10%. Muscle in men, 45%, and women, 37%. That means about half of our body weight is muscles and bones. 
So today's topic of MSK imaging and theme on practical essentials update is therefore highly relevant. Bones provide the structure and form whilst our muscles, tendons, ligaments, and other connective tissues help us move. And we all know what it is like if we are forced to be immobile because of injury or disease. The AOSR is grateful to the AOSR Education Committee for organizing a stellar faculty, faculty from UK to Oman, India, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan. They will be speaking on a variety of topics that will be relevant to every one of us, as many of us are also general radiologists. The AOSR also highly appreciates our speakers for their time and efforts, and of course, our moderators and webinar enablers from the Docto. Finally, what is a webinar without an audience? We had 466 registrants, and after filling a feedback form, which I hope all of you watching will do, there will be a certificate of attendance either emailed to you or downloadable from the platform. For those who have registered but didn't manage to watch it live, it will be reviewable for a short period on our AOSR, AOSR Bidocto platform. Thank you very much to all of you and every one of our audience for prioritizing this Sunday afternoon for CPD. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vivian, for your message. Himan, sir. Himan, sir. Hi, Vara. Yes, yeah. Vara. Yeah, please uh, say a few words welcoming our Thanks. delegates. And yeah. Uh, very good morning and uh, good afternoon to some part of the Asia as well. And uh, it's very warm welcome for this MSK imaging series of AOSR. Uh, I thank you, Evelyn, for you know pushing uh, our education committee to perform uh, more and more month by month. And uh, we are, as a AOSR, committed for comprehensive welfare of all the radiologists in Asian region. We are thrilled that we are starting with this MSK imaging session today, and it's a very rich content kind of the program scheduled today. And we thank all the eminent speaker from various countries of the Asia and Europe, Dr. Stephen Wong, Dr. James Griffith, Dr. Uh, Tamotsu, Dr. Harun, Dr. Ashwin, and many, uh, Dr. Obir, and many other eminent faculties, they are taking and sharing their uh, knowledge with our delegates today. I wholeheartedly thank Dr. Vara Prasad and Gaurang for uh, fine tune up of the entire program and making this to happen in a very short period of time. And uh, I am sure that we will have such kind of the more series down the line. We are also coming up with the Onco Imaging series after two months, and it will be the continuous affair on part of the OSR. Once again, I welcome all the delegates and uh, many congratulations for being a part of escalating the musculoskeletal imaging in the Asian region. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. I think, uh, uh, Gaurang, we can start the session. Okay, so without much ado, I would like to start session. Just before I start the session, I would like to reiterate what Dr. Evelyn Madam has said. Uh, we would request all the participants to fill the feedback form. Once you fill the feedback form, you'll be able to download your certificate of participation. If someone uh, by any chance is not able to attend today's webinar, um, a link will be sent to email of everybody. Uh, you can access this webinar's recorded version for the coming two weeks and fill the feedback form and also get a certificate. Without much ado, let's uh, begin today's session. Uh, can I have the introductory slide of uh, Dr. James Griffith, please? Sarita. Sarita. John, are Yeah. Uh, our first speaker for today is uh, Dr. James Griffith. He is professor and chairman in Department of Imaging and Interventional Radiology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he has published more than 200, uh, 300 papers and written uh, chapters in five books. His interest is in all aspects of musculoskeletal imaging. He is recipient of uh, the immediate past, uh, he's the recipient of many awards. He himself is the immediate past president of the Asian Musculoskeletal Society. And he is immediate past global chairman outreach program of International Skeletal Society. Uh, welcome. Dr. James Griffith, sir, for today's session. And he would be talking today on the osteochondral lesions of the Telar dome pre and post operative imaging. Uh, thank you, Garang. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to talk to you about 
osteochondral lesions of the Taylor Dome pre and post um, operative imaging. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay, great. Now, osteochondral, and you can all see the slides. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, osteochondral lesions of the Taylor Dome are a common pathology. And not only are they sort of, um, do we need to know them about themselves, but they also provide a good model for studying osteochondral lesions more generally throughout your body. Osteochondral lesions of the Taylor Dome are usually um, post-traumatic in origin, but not always. There may also be a, a vascular element in that the central part of the Taylor Dome is relatively less perfused than the anterior part, which is supplied by the tibialis anterior, and the posterior part, which is supplied by the tibialis posterior arteries. And there's also some mor morphological predisposition of your ankle to osteochondral lesions like increased tibial tailor tilt, etc. Now, if you divide the Taylor dome into a grade, into a nine-part grade, the vast majority of osteochondral lesions tend to occur on the mediocentral aspect, and then next most commonly on the lateral central aspect of the Taylor dome. Medial lesions tend to be um, wider, they tend to be deeper, and they tend to be more of an impaction type of injury, whereas lateral injuries tend to be smaller and shallower, and they tend to be more of a shear type injury, and they're also more likely to be post-traumatic. Now, about 40% of, radi of radiographs um, will demonstrate an osteochondral lesion if it's present. You can see them, see them if they're present in about 70% of CT examinations, but they're seen on consistently on all MRI examinations. So MRI is a very good, both a positive predictive value and a negative predictive value for osteochondral lesions. In other words, if the MRI scan is normal, then you do not have an osteochondral lesion. It's true MRI that we've, that we've been able to recognize and to understand osteochondral lesions a lot better in the last um, 20 or so years. Now, the sort of the main thrust of my talk is going to try to encourage you to do as high resolution imaging as possible for osteochondral lesions to, to sort of max out on the information that you can provide um, when, you're, when you see these abnormalities. Now you can use a small field of view um, setting with a standard, say, foot and ankle coil. But what we prefer to use is a small finger coil placed either medially or lateral over the ankle once you've seen the osteochondral lesion on standard imaging. And we do this routinely for all osteochondral lesions of the Taylor Dome. You can see that for the same um, geometry, the signal to noise of a finger coil at 3T is over almost three, nearly three times that of a, of a single, of, 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 of the signal to noise of a footing ankle coil using a small field of view. So the, in, it gives a much larger signal to noise um, benefit than either e even um, small field of view imaging with a standard coil. Now this is a standard coil. In this case, we've used a wraparound coil around the ankle. And you can see this osteochondral lesion quite nicely. Um, you can see the, you know, the surface of the bone, you can see the cartilage, but look what happens when you put on a finger coil, then you can very clearly see how there's osteochondral separation. You can see a fracture and you can provide a lot more information to the referring clinician than just simply saying that there is an osteochondral lesion present and giving its dimensions. So, and we also, in addition to using um, a finger coil, we also routinely use traction in patients who have um, a, a demonstrable um, osteochondral lesion on standard imaging. How, we, how do we apply traction? Well, we've set up just an, uh, our own sort of device. We put a plastic perspex um, dish effectively against the base of the foot, and then we apply a weight of eight to, eight to 10 kilograms 
to the foot during imaging. So again, here, this is a non-traction MRI, and you can appreciate with traction how you can separate the articular cartilages very nicely at the ankle and give you good information about the surface of the articular cartilage. And traction is very well tolerated. You don't get this effect with doing an MR arthrogram because what an MR arthrogram tends to do is it tends to um, distend the median or the anterior and posterior recesses of the ankle, but doesn't tend to cause distraction of the tibiotalar articulation. So as I mentioned, we routinely use a small field of view coil and also traction imaging. You can put the small field of view coil either medially um, or laterally, depending on where the, where the um, osteochondral lesion is located. And these are the sequences we do then post small field of view coil. We do a PD coronal, a T2 fat sat coronal, and a T2 fat sat sagittal. The overall thing takes about 10 minutes extra. It's very well tolerated. I appreciate it, it involves more time and you've got to encourage the radiographers to do it because they generally don't like doing it. But when after a while, when they realize that it's routine, then they get, then it's just done routinely, effectively. And we do this because we, we feel that the information it provides is just so far greater that you can get with standard imaging that we would routinely do it on all patients with osteochondral lesions. And if they haven't had it done, we call them back in a few days time for it to be done, you know, with small field of view and traction imaging. Now, these are the types of abnormalities you do see with osteochondral lesions. First, you've got to realize the Taylor dome is not flat, particularly on the medial side of the Taylor dome, you've got a shoulder. Um, you also may have a smaller shoulder on the lateral side, but the medial shoulder tends to be larger, but quite variable in size. Sometimes at the earliest stages, you may just get bone marrow edema of the subchondral bone, but then importantly, what will happen, particularly medial lesions, is you'll get collapse of the subchondral bone plate. And then you get osteochondral separation. This is a very significant event because as, as you can imagine, this type of abnormality will make a full recovery. This will never make a full recovery. What may happen occasionally is that the articular cartilage may hypertrophy to, almost, to restore almost near um, um, articular surface contour. Now, less frequently then, you may get bony separation, which may be um, partial or may be complete. The most common abnormalities that you'll find though is either this type of abnormalities with just subchondral bone marrow changes or next most common or also very common is osteochondral separation. So, You've got to optimize your imaging and let's show you some examples. This is a standard MR of the ankle. And then you can see, appreciate when you do a small field of view coil and traction imaging, how you can very clearly delineate how there's complete loss of articular cartilage over the medial aspect of the Taylor dome. There's no bony collapse and there's also articular cartilage thinning over the tibial plafond. Another lesion here, Again, you can see that there's no, um, you, you, you can appreciate that there's an osteochondral lesion on the medial central aspect of the Taylor dome. When you, when you do um, traction and small field of view coil imaging, you appreciate more readily how there's some cartilage hypertrophy. You can also appreciate how the cartilage is of different signal intensity to the remaining thin cartilage over the um, Taylor Dome, you can appreciate how there's disruption of the osteochondral plate. So what has happened here is that, this, is that there's been some reparative cartilage hypertrophy, and you can appreciate that much more readily than with standard um, imaging. Another example here, you can see, um, again, an osteochondral lesion at the medial central aspect of the Taylor Dome, but on with traction imaging, you can appreciate how there's moderate irregularity of the surface of the, that cartilage, but there's no osteochondral separation. Another example here, again, you can see the cartilage quite nicely, but when you, when you do traction imaging, you can appreciate now that there's a fracture present. And this was done like literally 10 minutes after this first examination. There's a fracture present 
and and um there's been some collapse of the subchondral bone plate, but just difficult to appreciate that on standard imaging. And finally, another example, again, a collapse of the subchondral bone, overlying cartilage looks, seems quite reasonable, but when you do uh, osteoattraction and small field of view imaging, so you can appreciate you've got very high signal intensity in this area because the coil is placed over the medium malleolus, but you get loss of signal then towards the remainder of the ankle joint. But you can appreciate there's osteochondral separation and the fracture that is very difficult even in retrospect to diagnose initially. So what you, what you should routinely report on is the location of the lesion, the size of the osteochondral lesion. Don't measure the um, bone marrow edema, but just measure the actual size of the osteochondral lesion itself. What is the overlying cartilage looks like? Is, is, in, um, is there any partial defect? Is there any separation or is there any fracture? Is there any collapse or separation of the subchondral bone? And also report on the marrow component, whether it's cystic, whether it's oedematous, or whether it's sclerosis of the subchondral bone. And also report on the extent of the bone marrow edema, because that gives an indication as to the activity of the lesion. And other features as well, of course, the presence of diffusion, synovitis, tibial tail or tilt, etc. Now, so how do we report these? This is just give you some examples about how to report these type of lesions. This is an osteochondral lesion at the lateral aspect. You can see the fibula here. Uh, how, what would you say about this? Well, we'd say that there's a medium size and give the measurements. Osteochondral lesion at the lateral central aspect of the Taylor dome with mild articular surface collapse and osteochondral separation. There are two undisplaced fractures of the overlying articular cartilage. The articular cartilage component seems moderately unstable, while the osseous component, the osteochondral lesion, is stable. Another example here, again, an osteochondral lesion on the medial central aspect of the dome would collapse the subchondral bone. There is a medium sized osteochondral lesion on the medial central aspect of the dome with moderate subchondral bone collapse. There is osteochondral separation with near complete separation of the fractured articular cartilage fragment. The articular cartilage component seems very unstable, while the osseous component is stable. Another example here, a medium-sized osteochondral lesion on the medial central aspect of Taylor dome, moderate subchondral bone collapse. There is hypertrophy or reparative hypertrophy of the affected articular cartilage to restore near normal articular contour. Both the articular cartilage and the um, bone component of the osteochondral lesion are stable. Just to give you an example of how these lesions would be reported. So for osteochondral lesions of the Taylor dome, you do need high resolution imaging to clearly see the relevant features, um, which will have clinical implications. Think in terms of, is the bone collapsed? Is there osteochondral separation? And think about whether the cartilage component is stable or is the bone component stable? And bony instability is very uncommon, whereas cartilage instability is a very common feature. Now, for treatment of osteochondral lesions, they're generally treated initially conservatively with mobil immobilization and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But later on, they can have various types of surgery. The most common surgery is simply chondroplasty, where you remove and the um, ca uh, cartilage fragment, and then you do drilling of our microfracture of the subchondral bone plate. You may also get do regenerative um, surgery with chondrous autologous um, or other um, chondrocyte implantation, or you may do replacement um, surgery with osteochondral allografts or autographs. Now, what, for post-operative imaging, effectively, you look for the same features that you look for preoperatively. It's not really any different. It's best to have preoperative imaging available for comparison. And so far, there's little or no correlation between clinical symptomat symptomatology and MRI features. But I think that's because 
most of the studies have not been doing a very high resolution of these osteochondral lesions. Let's have a look at some examples. This is an osteochondral lesion. Um, this was an MRI examination done pre, um, six months pre-op. You can see there's a mild degree of osteochondral separation, so the cartilage fracture, the cartilage is otherwise intact. There was a chondroplasty, the chondral flap was removed, the brimment, a microfracture. And then five years post-op, you can see now there's quite, quite a lot of cartilage hypertrophy. And so overall now the, le the lesion is much better and the cystic component has also improved compared to preoperative imaging. Another example, not the best example, but you can see the cartilage component seems to be relatively stable. Preoperatively, there's a moderate amount of bone marrow edema. The patient had a chondroplasty, but then four years afterwards, it's actually worse. The cartilage seems to have regenerated quite well, but there's a cartilage fracture and there's osteochondral separation. So very similar to what you'd see preoperatively, really looking at the same sort of features. So this is definitely a case which seems worse um, postoperatively. Another case here, this is a lateral lesion. You can see preoperatively there's fractures. There's a small amount of osteochondral separation tre treated again with chondroplasty. And then nine months post-op, well, now you've got cartilage thinning and a bone boss or some bone hyperostosis. But overall, the, what, the cartilage component previously was unstable. Now it's stable, but it's quite thinned. And uh, so changes in the appearances, but probably, um, but you know, so maybe marginally better than the preoperative appearances. So in conclusion, the key to assessment of Taylor Dome or to full assessment of Taylor Dome osteochondral lesions is high resolution imaging. Um, you can get this really with using a small field of view coil as, in addition to traction imaging. It doesn't take too long. Think about bone collapse, osteochondral separation, cartilage fracture, as well as cartilage and bone stability. You'll see similar changes post-op as pre-op. So focus primarily on high resolution imaging, I think is a key to a sort of a full assessment of osteochondral lesions. Thank you very much Zing, for your attention. It's a fantastic lecture, James, as usual. It's really amazing covering all aspects of osteochondral lesions. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot. Uh, any questions from our faculty on board and also from any delegates? Sarita? As of now, no, sir. So, uh, James, uh, I just had a doubt. Uh, this is uh, if there is a middle uh, ligament complex or lateral ligament complex tears where there is an increase in clear space on medial side or lateral side. Is anything related to uh, increase the stress on telodome and predisposed to osteochondral injuries if not diagnosed early and treated early? Oh, yeah, you have a very good question. Thank you. And that's actually a very important factor. And that's why we would routinely do a standard, you know, imaging of the whole ankle because you, you've got to assess the tibio taylor relationship very much because it, even if you've got a very small one millimeter of, of translation, it can increase tibio taylor pressure by 42%. Yes. That's a profound effect. And also if there's increased tibio taylor tilt or things like pace planus, all of these features are important, you know, features to note. So, yeah, you definitely need a fuller examination of the whole ankle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what I observed in most of these osteochondral lesions is there, there is, as you said, that, that one millimeter difference is very, very important mm -hmm. and very crucial in reporting even plane radiographs. Uh, yes. uh, so that uh, the, so that they, they, this will be mechanically, they'll try to see that the stability is maintained. Uh, so thank you very much for highlighting this. Yeah. Go thank on, you. Laura. Yes, sir. Uh, the lecture was really very wonderful. And uh, uh, luckily, I saw uh, uh, osteochondral lesion yesterday itself. And I had to report. And this lecture will really help me to uh, give the report in more details. I'm sure I speak for all the participants. Uh, this was really an update on what we usually uh, image 
and uh, what what are the changes from acute to chronic and how things change even the small cartilage fractures we can pick up by using the small fov coils it yes. is very, very useful thank you so much sir thank you um, i think we can move on to our next lecture dr uh, sarita can i have the introductory slide please our next uh, speaker is dr abir uh, madam abir is from oman and she is a consultant musculoskeletal radiologist welcome madam uh, she has published a paper on the variants and pitfalls of mr imaging in shoulder injuries and unusual case of swelling in upper limb kimura disease imaging in ankle impingement syndrome and uh, mr imaging of cysts cyst like lesion and their mimickers around the knee joint we are really thrilled to have you madam uh, for your lecture and um, welcome madam over to you thank you so much for the invitation i'll start sharing my screen Why well, cannot share my screen here? I'm going to the desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. We can see the screen. Please open the presentation. Now. Is it visible? Yes, madam, it's visible. Okay, I'll start from the first slide. So it's my pleasure today. Thank you so much for the invitation and for organizing this webinar. Uh, so I'll start presenting on the meniscal injuries of the knee. We will first discuss the brief normal meniscal anatomy and the normal variants that can mimic meniscal tear. It's very important to know the normal variants and not to be mistaken it as a tear in your report in order to aid for the orthopedic surgeons not to go for unnecessary arthroscopic surgery. And then we'll talk about different types of meniscal tears and the MRI appearance of the meniscal tears. So the aim of this um, lecture is to recognize the anatomic variants, to ensure diagnostic accuracy and to prevent unnecessary surgery, to identify the meniscal tear on MRI images, to describe and to classify the tears according to their various types. So the meniscal injury is one of the most frequently occurring injury of the knee. It's common in sports like in football, as well as jumping, volleyball and soccer and other event sports related injuries. It's, it has a special risk in older athletes since the meniscus will weaken with age. Uh, there is no universally agreed system classification of the meniscal tears. However, different centers reported as different. Some reported as a full thickness or a partial thickness tear according to the thickness which is involved. Some do degraded for a grade three that there is a definite tear which is abutting the surfaces superior or inferior articular surface or into the free edge. Or you definitely, you describe detail the tear according to the direction of the tear, whether it's horizontal, oblique, whether it's uh, vertical and so on. And we'll go through different also the, um, the displaced uh, meniscal fragments. So the acute meniscal tears usually occur most often from twisting injuries, while the chronic degenerative tear occur in older patients and it can occur with minimal twisting or stress to the knee. It can occur in isolation alone or in association with collateral or cruciate ligament tears. Uh, and the median 
meniscus is more commonly injured compared to the lateral meniscus. Why is that? It's because of the anatomy of the medial meniscus where it's firmly attached to the capsule and to the medial collateral ligament. So it's less mobile and makes it vulnerable to tear. And patients with ACL deficient knees are more at risk for medial meniscus tear. Uh, so let us go briefly through the anatomy. So the meniscus is a wet shaped pad which is located between the femoral condyles and the tibial plateau and it's of the fibrocartilaginous structure. That's why we see it of very low signal intensity on all sequences. And it is in dissipating loading forces placed on the knee, stabilizing the knee during rotation and lubricating the knee joint. So here we have the diagrammatic view of the lateral meniscus where you can see it as a C-shaped configuration while the medial meniscus, it's larger enough U-shaped configuration. Uh, each one of them has an interior posterior horn and a body which lies between the interior and posterior horn. It's the blood supply of the meniscus, it's primary avascular structure. But when it gets the blood supply, it's from the peripheral branches of the popliteal, such as the medial, lateral, and inferior uh, middle and geniculate arteries. So you have the red zone, which is the peripheral one third of the meniscus, and the white zone, which is the inner two thirds of the meniscus. The white zone, which is the avascular, it has no blood supply. That's why when tears occur in this area, we suspect that there is a poor healing of this meniscus. Also the success of the surgery is less of the repair compared to the peripheral one third, which is the red zone, which is very vascular. It has good healing process. And then you have the junction of the red white zone junction. Uh, for the normal median meniscus appearance on MRI, it's of uh, the morphology of it, it's of smooth surface triangular with a smooth tapering and it's at three edge. This is the posterior horn of the median meniscus and the interior horn of the median meniscus. The posterior horn of median meniscus normally it's of larger in size than the Sarita, any issue? Yes, sir. I think ma'am lost the connection. We lost the voice. Lights are not moving. I think uh, check that. Yes, ma'am ma lost the connection, I guess. Yes, it seems so. Um, we will wait for a few minutes. I'll give her a call. Are, are you able to hear me? Uh, Dr. Yes, Abir? Yes. No, I I'll give her a call. I think uh, now yeah. it's fine again. Yeah. I think there is some internet issue. Uh, call on WhatsApp to Dr. Abir Sarita. Yes, sir. Calling, sir. disruption madam we lost you in between can you um, maybe because of the network collect uh where did you can you can you just share your screen please ma'am here you are screen slide before that uh, i think go, go to to the slides back and let me start this is it here was it here I think you, you can start from here and continue. Dr. Abir, you can start from here. He's again stuck. I think again, her internet stuck, I think. Yes, sir.
Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm. I'll go back to the. So the normal lateral meniscus. We said about the posterior root ligament. We have of the lateral and of the medial meniscus. And here we have the speckled or laminated appearance of the lateral meniscus, which of the anterior horn of lateral meniscus, which should not mimic as a tear because of the normal fibers of ACL fibers inserts into head interjugate. And this is a common finding of the laminated speckled appearance of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And the other variant that can mimic a tear, we have the meniscal flounce, the meniscal femoral ligament, the anterior transverse intermeniscal ligament, the oblique meniscal meniscal ligament, and the fluid in the popliteus recess. So the meniscal flounce, the appearance of it on MRI as the arrow points, it's a wavy, undulated, a small kind of fold which happens, or a kink, which happens in the body of the, uh, either medial or lateral meniscus. Uh, there are lots of factors which contribute to it. One of the most common due to the extensive flexion of the knee, and it can subside with the extension of the knee. And then you have the menisco femoral ligament. Ligament of Humphrey and ligament of Rasberg. Uh, ligament of Humphrey seen on the sagittal just interior to the PCL and ligament of Rasberg is seen posterior to the PCL. Uh, and on this sagittal plane, you can see it can mimic a peripheral vertical tear in the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. But then while scrolling through the images um, forward and backwards, you'll know it's from the uh, meniscal femoral ligament, either Humphrey or Rasberg. Then you have the interior transverse intermeniscal ligament, which is best assessed on the axial, where you can see it intersecting from the interior horn of the medial meniscus to the interior horn of the lateral meniscus. And again, you should not mistake it as a loose fragment or as a tear. And the oblique meniscal meniscal ligament, when you see the sagittal alone, you can, it mimics to you like a bucket handle at the intercondylar, uh, I mean, displaced meniscal fragment. But while seeing the whole of the images, the menisci are of normal morphology, normal signal intensity, normal surfaces. And then going back to the axial, you see that it's extending from the anterior horn of the medial meniscus to the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Then you have the fluid in the popliteus recess. This is very, very common. You all always see in the coronal, if you see the coronal alone, you'll think that it's a peripheral oblique tear in the posterior horn of lateral meniscus. While seeing the axial and the sagittal, you'll see the fluid surrounding the popliteus tendon and in the popliteus recess region. So that's why it's very, very important to see at least, at least two planes in MRI in order not to mistake in it as a tear. So the clinical presentation, they present, they can present with pain, swelling, popping sensation, difficulty in bending or straightening the knee, a locked knee. The locked knee, when they present more of locked knee, you will think of a uh, bucket handle and the variance, the most common presentation, and then giving away knee. So the criteria to diagnose a tear, you have, a, you have to have a signal intensity of fluid. It has to be of a fluid signal, which is extending to the superior or inferior articular surface or into the free edge. And it's best visualized on the sagittal PD images. And of course, a tear, you suspect a tear if there is only abnormal morphology, abnormal shape or size without a prior surgery. For the grading system, um, you can grade it according to zero. Of course, it's a normal meniscus. One and two, where you have the 
abnormal signal, which is not intersecting, not abutting the superior or inferior articular surface. Uh, and we call it as myxoid degeneration, where you have an intermediate signal intensity. And grade three is a clear tear, which abuts either surfaces, either superior, inferior, or both surfaces, or into the free edge. Uh, we start radial tear is a commonly degenerative tear. It's more commonly seen in older than 50 years of age. And the most vulnerable region to get a radial tear is the posterior horn of medial meniscus. And it has strong association and increased incidence severity of cartilage degeneration compared to the horizontal tear. Uh, different appearance of radial tear in different planes. You have this sharp truncation this abnormal signal seen at the junction of the interior horn and the body of the lateral meniscus in the sagittal, in the coronal, and, and again in the axial, where it is, and the radial tear is best assessed if you have a thin section slices in the axial plane. Uh, most common, as we mentioned earlier, in the posterior horn of medial meniscus, followed by the posterior horn of lateral meniscus, body and the interior horn. Going to the meniscal cyst. Meniscal cysts are not that common, but they're often the result of extrusion of the fluid through the tear in the meniscus. You can have either parameniscal or intrameniscal, and they're very commonly associated with underlying horizontal tear. And 88% of parameniscal cysts are associated with underlying tear seen in the posterior horn of medial meniscus. But in case if you see a parameniscal cyst with no underlying tear, it's more commonly adjacent to the interior horn of the lateral meniscus. So here we have a horizontal tear in the posterior horn extending to the body of the medial meniscus. And the other sagittal plane shows a small parameniscal cyst surrounding it. So you have a parameniscal cyst with underlying a horizontal, large horizontal tear in the posterior horn extending to the body. Another case, again, we have a more larger parameniscal uh, cyst with underlying horizontal tear. And again, you see it's commonly seen in the posterior horn, in both cases, posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Uh, and again, a larger portion of the large parameniscal cyst seen more interiorly adjacent to the interior horn of medial meniscus. But when you scroll down to posteriorly, you see in the posterior horn, there is horizontal tear in the inferior articular surface of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Going through the discoid meniscus, discoid meniscus is usually seen in the lateral, more common compared to the uh, medial meniscus. 20% of cases can be bilateral and it's common in pediatrics and in young adults. It has increased, uh, increased tear tendency at the capsular attachment at the vascular supply. You can classify it as complete or incomplete. So this is a complete, there are two different patients, left knee and right knee, in the, sorry, in the same patient. He was an 18, year old, 18 years old teenager patient who came with a history of uh, pain and um, uh, difficulty in bending his knee. So if you recognize here, if we mentioned earlier that the lateral meniscus, both are of equal size, but here we see the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, it's, it's larger and globular compared to the interior horn that there is a meniscal contusion. And in addition, in scrolling the images, there was more than three bow tie uh, appearance. And in addition, we have a large fluid signal intensity within it, a large horizontal tear intersecting the whole lateral meniscus. So we have here a discoid meniscus, and this discoid meniscus, we consider it as complete rather than incomplete. What I mean by complete, that it is involving the whole lateral tibial plateau, 100% of the lateral tibial plateau, compared to the incomplete or a partial discoid where it involves less than 80%. Uh, and the same patient again has a discoid meniscus, but if you see both are of equal size here, there is no meniscal contusion, but there is a horizontal tear. And this is the extra meniscal tissue, which, which we know that there is a discoid meniscus. So what about the meniscal root tear? The meniscal root tear occurs more in the posterior um, medial meniscus, posterior root of the medial meniscus compared to the interior root, and it's often degenerative. Uh, we see here the meniscal root tear in the um, posterior horn, avulsion of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Normally, just interior to the PCL, you have to see a 
low signal intensity of a meniscus way, it lies the posterior root ligament of the medial meniscus. But here it is not seen. So you should suspect that there is a posterior root avulsion or a posterior root tear, which is seen here. And in addition with it, we said it's often degenerated. So you have here marginal osteophytes in the medial compartment. In addition, cartilage loss in the medial femoral, femorotibial compartment with subchondral marrow edema and with the narrowing of the joint space, which has caused a bit of the peripheral extrusion of the body. So it's more commonly occurs with osteoarthritic changes. For the meniscal capsule separation, it's typically associated with the ACL injuries. Incidence, it's from 16 up to 23%. Uh, acute tears, according to the histopathology, are classified as hemorrhagic, complete or incomplete, while the chronic are classified as scarring, elongation, or complete tears. And it's described in combination with semi-membranosis disruption. So on your left side, you have the meniscal capsular separation. The meniscal capsular region occurs just periphery to the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, where you see the abnormal signal. It's kind of a very high signal where it indicates there is a meniscal capsular separation. And in the same patient, we have also a complex tear where you have a multi-directional tear, a vertical tear extending to the superior articular surface and an oblique tear extending into the inferior articular surface. And the complex tear, once you see a complex tear, it implies usually an unstable rather than a stable knee. So the displaced meniscal injuries occur in both medial and lateral menisci. We have bucket handle tear, which are fragments of complete longitudinal tears that migrate centrally over the remaining menisci. The flap tear, which are horizontal tears with partial detached fragments, and the parrot peak tears, which are radial tears with partially detached fragments. Uh, the bucket handle tear, it's a most common displaced meniscal injuries. It occurs in 10% of patients and it results from a longitudinal oblique or a vertical tear of a meniscus that has an attached fragment displaced away from the meniscus. The typical location of a displaced meniscal tissue, the typical that the residents, the R1 residents also should know that the, it's at the intercondylar notch and it's interior and parallel to the PCL forming a double PCL sign. So here you have a patient with a large meniscal fragment, which is seen at the intercondylar notch region. And it's forming a double, this is the actual, the normal PCL and this large meniscal fragment, it has formed a double PCL sign. And this is the displaced fragment, which is seen at the intercondylar notch region. And again, in the axial, you can see it. And then once you see a displaced fragment at the intercondylar region and forming a double PCL sign, you need to check where's the donor side which is coming on. But from the coronal, if we see that comparing the medial from the lateral meniscus, it's the medial meniscus which is macerated, which is smaller in size, so it's coming from the medial meniscus. Uh, again, another bucket handle, typical like the previous case, but this has happened in an ACL reconstruction patient where you have a large meniscal fragment, again, forming a double PCL sign. So it also can happen in a post ACL reconstruction, especially if they go back to early to sports and the injury they need. And this is another case of a bucket handle of a variant of a bucket handle, again, tear, but this is a smaller portion, which is seen displaced fragment at the interior portion of the intercondylar notch seen on the sagittal, the coronal, and also on the axial plane. And here you see the medial meniscus, posterior horn of medial meniscus, normal size, normal mor morphology, signal intensity, but the lateral meniscus, which has been the posterior horn, which is serrated. So it's coming from the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. For the flipped, going to the flipped meniscus, it's a form of a bucket handle tear. Uh, it, uh, it's basically capsular detachment or peripheral or a complete peripheral longitudinal vertical tear of the meniscus, which is usually the posterior horn. The posterior horn, what happens in a flipped meniscus that the posterior horn flips over onto the interior horn. It implies either the menisco capsular uh, detachment separation or a menisco popliteal detachment. Uh, so here you have the menisco popliteal detachment. If you see, you can't see here the posterior horn of the 
lateral meniscus. The posterior horn of lateral meniscus has been flipped over and lying just anterior to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, forming a double delta sign. They call it as a double delta sign and there is a leaving an empty space at the donor side. So this implies a meniscal popliteal detachment. For the medial meniscus, again, you can see that the posterior horn is almost macerated of the medial meniscus and the posterior horn of medial meniscus has been flipped over and just lying to the, just adjacent to the interior horn of the medial meniscus forming a double delta sign. And this implies a meniscal capsular detachment. Uh, the flap tear, horizontal tear, which gives rise to the, it, the horizontal tears that gives rise to flap tears, they're usually underlying horizontal tear, it's classified according to the surface where it arises from. If it arises from the superior surface, articular surface, we call it as a superior uh, flap tear, while if it arises from the inferior articular surface, we call it as an inferior flap. Uh, comparing the, and it's most commonly in medially rather than laterally. It's six to seven times commoner in the medial aspect compared to the lateral aspect. And the superior medial part is more common location compared to the anteromedial location. So here we have a patient with a, um, as you can see in consecutive axial images, they have a displaced, um, uh, I mean, a meniscal fragment, which has been seen in the medial gutter, just deep to the MCL. And, it, and you see it's arising in the coronal from the superior articular surface. So we call it as a superior medial flap tear. And then another patient, which is well seen, you can see a well-rounded, well-defined, rounded, low signal intensity. It's kind of a lesion in the both sagittal and also in the axial, if you can mimic it as a loose body. But while seeing then, and while scrolling even more in the axial and sagittal in the coronal, you see it, it's continuation and it's arriving from the superior articular surface. Again, it's a superior medial flap tear. And as we mentioned, it's in the medial gutter, just deep to the MCL. For the inferior uh, flap tear, uh, because I didn't have a case from our center, so I just brought a diagram. It's basically, it's the same idea behind it, is a horizontal tear which runs through under surface, but instead of displacing it superiorly, superior medial, it's from the inferior articular surface displaced and from medially, and in the medial gutter again, just deep to the MCL. A study of, was done, this is a study from the Journal of AGR, of a 1,000 symptomatic meniscal lesions. 6% six six of all medial meniscus fragments were inverted. 51% of the inverted fragments were flaps, and the rest were ruptured bucket handle fragments. Experienced orthopedic surgeons believe that nearly all of the inferior medial displaced fragments seen at arthroscopy is from the medial meniscus that result of the flap tears. According to the classification of the meniscal tears, according to Dandy, the type of the tear that correlates best with the MRI and the results of the arthroscopic is the inferior flap tear. The parrot peak meniscal tear is it going now to the parrot peak. It's a type of the radial tear which is connected in one plane and displaced in other plane. It's a curved V-shaped which forms like a parrot peak in appearance. Um, usually it's reserved for arthroscopic reports. We don't like to report it as a parrot peak meniscal tear rather than using it in MRI reports. However, and sometimes in clear case, we had one case which was a typical, like a curved V-shaped, which we called it as a parrot peak. Here we had a patient. If we, you see here in the coronal plane, there is a small fragment and it was coming attached to the meniscus and it has a radial tear, which is sharp truncation at the free edge of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And you see in the other sagittal, it formed like a curved V shape, like a parrot peak appearance. In this case, we, we called it as a variant of bucket handle and it was a parrot peak um, meniscal tear. Other associated ligamentous injury, we can have uh, the lateral meniscus tear, which is often associated with the acute ACL tear, the medial meniscus tear, which is often associated with the chronic ACL tear. And then we have an unhappy triad. As we mentioned earlier, the meniscus tear can, sometimes it's not just in isolation. We can have, again, association with the ACL and medial collateral tear, like in this case. 
uh, we can see here this there is fluid and edema just adjacent periphery to the uh, superficial fibers of the MCL forming a grade one sprain injury. And then we have here the radial tear, the sharp truncation at the free edge of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And here we have a tear at the ACL fibers near its femoral attachment. So this is an unhappy, unhappy triad of the ACL, the medial meniscus and the MCL. Uh, going to the meniscal ossicle, if we see the radiographs alone, it can mimic be mistaken as a loose body, but then it took the shape of a triangular morphology shape of meniscus. And on the MRI, it has confirmed that it, there is a meniscal ossicle within the meniscus, because and it's the same signal as the bone. So you know there is ossification of the meniscus. The meniscal ossicle is rare, uncommon, but it's a well-documented finding and its ossification within the substance of the meniscus. It was first described in literature in 1930s. The prevalence is 0.15% in case series of 1,287 consecutive MRI examination, in, which was published in AGR in 2014. The etiology of the meniscal ossicle can be congenital, can be degenerative or traumatic. Majority associated with the posterior horn of the meniscal boot tears and a high incidence of focal cartilage loss as well as ACL tears. And as we mentioned, it can be mistaken for intra-articular loose bodies, particularly on the X-rays radiographs. So in conclusion, the meniscal tears are common in sports and sports related injuries knowledge and understanding of the normal anatomical structure and the vascularity of the meniscus as well as the pattern of the tear is very important in order to aid in your diagnostic. Thank, and thank you so much. Thank you. I hope it was clear. And sorry for inter the interruption. Thank you so much, madam, uh, for yes. having this wonderful lecture. Um, it was really very informative for the meniscal injuries. Uh, knee MRI, I think, is one of the most common MRIs we do every day. And it, uh, Thank you, Abir. It's a fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Word from normal anatomy to pathologies and various variants. Thank you so much for being there with us today. Go on next. Yeah. Ashwin? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Hi, welcome, Ashwin. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Wonderful program. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ashwin Lavande, and uh, this is a bit personal for me. Dr. Ashwin Lavande, sir, is my teacher of ultrasound. He has literally held my hand and taught me how to perform ultrasound, especially the musculoskeletal ultrasound during my residency days. Uh, he is the chief radiologist at Dr. Mukun Joshi Clinic, uh, and he is more interested into sports uh, medicine and ultrasound. He is also associated with Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital, Mumbai. He has 12 publications in various journals and one chapter in the ultrasound of hip in the textbook. Uh, over to you, Ashwin, sir. Looking forward. Thank you, Gaurang. Thank you, uh, Vara. Pleasure to be here on a Sunday. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So this topic is quite close to my heart and uh, it's basically uh, how, what, how you can help a surgeon, you know, uh, uh, while you do musculoskeletal ultrasound, you report a lot of things, but when you think from a perspective of a surgeon, how it will help him while performing a surgery, it really makes a lot of difference the way you conduct your scan and way you report your findings. So that's the, so whenever you have these carpal tunnel syndrome cases, you typically report your median nerve compressions in the carpal tunnel and uh, various other findings. But the most important thing is uh, whenever you have cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, normally what an orthopedic surgeon earlier used to do is he used to do a EM, uh, he used to examine the person clinically then he used to do a nerve conduction study, confirm that there was median nerve neuropathy due to compression in the carpal tunnel, and then he used to operate. But most of the times what used to happen was he used to miss out on synovitis or space occupying lesions in the carpal tunnel. And that is when just a carpal tunnel release would not work and the patient's symptoms uh, like restricted flexion of the fingers would have uh, been missed. 
and they would never uh, recover them. So then uh, I want to present you a few carpal tunnel cases initially where, uh, where a good ultrasound and uh, important findings can be picked up on imaging and that's how it helps the surgeon how to manage these patients. Now, when you see a normal carpal tunnel, this is the median nerve which is sitting on the long finger flexors in the carpal tunnel and it is normal in caliber throughout the tunnel. Whenever you get a carpal tunnel syndrome, or, or, and which is, which is for, there for quite some time, you see this kind of compression in the carpal tunnel, which is usually seen uh, when there are no space occupying lesions because of the uh, restricted space in the carpal tunnel. So you have typically the edematous nerve proximally and the compressed nerve in the distal or the proximal carpal tunnel. Now, what happens is on ultrasound extra, what you need to tell the surgeon is, apart from the compression of the median nerve, you have to tell if there is any space, space occupying lesion, for example, some synovitis or a ganglion. Now, let's see this case, which is very interesting. This patient had a middle-aged man with carpal tunnel symptoms. The median nerve in the proximal tunnel is not showing that significant enlargement, but it is 12 millimeter square. Then you see that the nerve in the distal carpal tunnel is showing a slightly big, uh, increased ratio uh, of the transverse diameter to the AP diameter. And you see a anechoic lesion there in the carpal tunnel, which is usually a ganglion. Then this is, you can see in the extended field of view, you can see the FPL tendon on one side, the median nerve compressed at the level of the ganglion and the other long finger flexors. This is in the long axis where you see the nerve getting impinged by the ganglion. And on the dynamic evaluation, which is so important, this is the FPL, that's the median nerve. And you can see the ganglion there kind of impinging on the nerve. And when you do a dynamic evaluation, flexing the fingers, you see the ganglion moving on the undersurface of the median nerve and compressing it and giving and accentuating, uh, giving rise to compression and accentuating the symptoms at that time. So this person was not able to write properly and hold the keyboard. So this was a ganglion and the root of the ganglion was kind of coming from the radiocarpal joint. There was no flexor synovitis. Because it was a short history and uh, the patient was having symptoms, the surgeon chose to operate on him after the ultrasound findings. And that was the ganglion there. And that's the root of the ganglion, which was coming from the radiocarpal joint and the whole ganglion was excised. So this is how just a, a meticulous ultrasound evaluation could help the surgeon in uh, treating this patient. This was a little difficult case where this patient had recurrent carpal tunnel syndrome. If you see the history here, this patient has got right carpal tunnel release in 2001. Then again, a right carpal tunnel release in 2018 after almost 17 years. Now, again, he has symptoms where there is severe sensory motor slowing across the wrist. So when we did the ultrasound evaluation, you saw the cross-sectional area in the median nerve of the median nerve in the distal forearm was nine millimeters square. At the site of enlargement, just proximal to the tunnel was around 27 millimeters square, which is significantly more. And you can see in the long axis, you see areas of two compressions. One is a very significant compression in the distal carpal tunnel area due to a thick fibrotic band. And then there is another compression, compressing area just a little pro, uh, at the proximal edge of the carpal tunnel there. So a diagnosis of two compressing uh, compress, uh, compression sites was given with fibrotic bands compressing the area. The flexor tendons were fine. There was no flexor synovitis in the carpal tunnel. On surgery, there was this first fibrotic band which was seen, which was quite thick proximally, and the other tight one distally. And then the entire thing was nicely released. And you can see that the nerve is comp was compressed at these two areas the distal one, which was more significant, and exactly the ultrasound was, the nerve was seen in that fashion. So this helps surgeon release it again completely, and now the symptoms are completely relieved for this patient. Sometimes the patients are not lucky and you get these sharp object injuries like a glass piece injury to this particular distal forearm of this patient. 
who fell on a glass and there was kind of a median nerve injury. You can see that in, in the still image, there is a kind of a partial thickness tear of this nerve here with loss of fascicular echo pattern. You can also see a foreign body, which is a glass piece because the patient had fallen on a glass. And then this is in the gla uh, glass piece in the short axis, the nerve showing vascularity at the side of injury. And in this movie, you can actually see that it was kind of a near full thickness tear with the foreign body along the deeper portion of the median nerve. That's the proximal nerve, the distal nerve going into the carpal tunnel. And that's in the short axis. So near complete transaction of the nerve was there. So the patient, uh, uh, surgeon had to excise this segment of the nerve and do an end-to-end -end suturing with removal of the foreign body. Next is a case where this is a young surgeon and uh, he had a little finger injury while doing surgery and then he was not able to flex his finger. So what you see here is the scan done along the volar aspect of the distal, uh, volar aspect of the right little finger. You hardly see any tendon tissue in the FDP sheath. This particular area at the base of the distal phalanx is abnormal and you can see a bony fragment there with an intact volar plate at the DIP joint. On the dynamic evaluation, that is passive dynamic, you are moving the tip of the finger, you are seeing the volar plate moving, but you don't see any tendon tissue there. That's the bony fragment there. Dynamic evaluation at the PIP joint level, you see that the FDS lateral slips are intact, but you don't see any FDP tendon tissue there. And you see the retracted portion of the FDP just this just distal to the MCP joint, maybe around 1.1 centimeter distally, and the bony fragment is around six millimeters there, which is the retracted portion of the FDP. Then you scan the FDP tendon in the palm, where you see again see a retraction and wavy appearance of the tendon, and then you tell the surgeon that yes, this is a zone two injury, and you need to operate on this patient, and the FDP has been retracted around one centimeter distal to the MCP joint. So that was the bony fragment with the FDP retracted portion. So the surgeon had to uh, pull the tendon all the way through the pulleys, annular pulleys, and then fix it up all the way at its insertion. Next is the case where there is a sharp object injury to the left thumb distal to the MCP joint. Again, I'm showing you a zone two injury because this is a little different case where there is an injury to the thumb volar aspect distal to the MCP joint and the patient has lost his flexion movement at the IP joint. What you see here is that the distal stump of the FPL on moving the thumb tip and then you don't see the FPL as you go in a transverse fashion through the thinar eminence into the distal forearm. So at this level, you see the FCR there and the retracted FPL in the distal forearm, which has retracted on itself. So the FPL tendon has retracted all the way into the distal forearm. And if the sur surgeon would not have insisted for an ultrasound, he would have expected that since it's a sharp object injury, the retraction is only minimal. So that's how ultrasound imaging helps to see the exact, uh, the exact tendon where it has retracted and hence the surgery can be planned accordingly. This was a tendon repair after which, after the intense physiotherapy, the patient had lost that finger movement. And you can see that in this movie, I'm moving the distal phalanx and that's the scar dehiscence. You can see the suture material, but the graft has undergone a tear at the PIP joint level. And if you trace the tendon tissue proximally, you can see that it has retracted at the mid shaft of the middle phal uh, proximal phalanx. And you can see the wavy appearance of the graft proximally in the palm. Then we have a zone two flexor injury where a sharp object injury has happened at the level of the PIP joint somewhere there. So you see this distal FDP stump, a complete tear of the FDP tendon and partial thickness, near full thickness tear of the FDS lateral slips at the PIP joint. So you hardly, you just see a flicker of movement proximally. And when you take an extended field of view like that, you actually see the gap between the tendon stumps. That's the FDP, which has retracted 
significantly proximally and which you can appreciate in this particular movie as you go this proximally you see that the fdp stump is located at the mcp joint level whereas the fds is partially intact so sometimes when the patient is not lucky and there are complete tear of the fds and fdp tendons and the retraction is in the palm then some procedures like these happen so they put a implant after reconstructing the pulleys we scan the implant later after the wound has healed and then we mark on the patient's body the point markings for the entry and exit sites for the graft and then the surgeon does a railroading kind of a procedure where the palmaris longer is harvested and attached to the silastic uh, implant there and pulled out from the next position there so they do this railroading process uh, and the entire graft is kind of put there in the place and the distal and the proximal ends are sutured then you have extensor tendon injuries where you have to differentiate whether it's a partial or a full thickness tear for example this is a cricket ball injury where you see that the finger was is was moving a little at the pip joint but it was not extending completely and not flexing completely so it's like a par near partial uh, near full thickness or a partial thickness a high grade partial thickness tear of the central band with an avulsed fragment from the base of the middle phalanx that's the proximal central band and as you move on either side of the central band these are the intact lateral bands which are in which are moving smoothly but slight restriction is there because of the pain due to the injury so most of the time such cases are conserved since it's a partial thickness tear but not so in the next case this is the extensor tendon at the base of the middle finger and as you go distally you are uh, the, there is loss of extension at the pip joint and you are moving the distal phalanx passively and you can see that there is a full thickness rupture injury to the central band here with an oval bony fragment there where the central band inserts you go on either side of the central band and you can see that the lateral slips lateral bands are intact so the surgeon will just have to in, uh, ensure that the central band is repaired and a good physiotherapy started later so that was the tear there and this is the central band which has been sutured sometimes the patient has injuries where there is there are fractures of the phalanges and after the fracture healing happens the patient is not able to flex or patient is not able to extend the finger completely so this was one such case where there was restricted flexion of the finger so the surgeon was thinking that there is some flex flexor tendon adherence at the fracture site but when we scanned this ring finger you can see that this is the a1 pulley the mcp joint the flexor tendons are moving beautifully you go distally again the flexor tendons are moving nicely the fracture was at the middle phalanx base and the mid shaft level somewhere here this is at the pip joint where again the flexors are nicely moving this is the fdp lateral slips inserting at the site of the fracture which has nicely healed so then we went on to the extensor aspect where you can see that that's the heel portion of the fracture there at the middle phalanx shaft level so this is the base of the middle phalanx you can see the central band inserting there which is moving nicely so there is no adhesions here but if you move a little distally you can see that the lateral bands are kind of adherent at the fracture side and along the scarring in the subcutaneous tissue so because the lateral bands are adherent at the middle middle uh, mid shaft of the middle phalanx at the fracture side that is why the patient is not able to flex the finger and when this was conveyed to the surgeon he could do a tenolysis and kind of shave off all the scar tissue there and with good physiotherapy the patient regained around 70 to 80% of his flexion movement next and important thing is 
when a surgeon does a lot of procedures for fracture healing say external fixators and all sometimes the tendons become uh, come at risk because these fix fixators they impinge on the on the tendons and they weaken them and predispose them for a tear so this is the first case where you have a healed distal radius fracture with the plate and c2 but the patient has de had developed a thumb restriction of uh, restricted flexion of the thumb and there was a lot of pain and kind of a click in the distal forearm just proximal to the wrist where the pain was there so if you see this is the fpl in the palm and you do a flexion of the thumb at the ip joint and you trace the fpl all the way back into the distal forearm at this place you can see that the fpl is showing a fusiform enlargement and the plate is going through and through the substance of the fpl dividing into into the proximal and uh, anterior and posterior segments so that's the plate you can see in transverse plane that's the fcr it's going through and through the fpl and that is why the patient was not able to flex the thumb completely and was under under uh, and was undergoing severe pain that's the plate along the distal radius a lot of scar tissue around it and if you see this particular mo movie in the transverse that's the plate going through and through the fpl that's the fcr median nerve and these are the long finger flexors which are smoothly moving over the plate and are not at risk so when you get such cases you have you are supposed to tell the surgeon that whether the distal edge of the plate which sometimes is a little uh, 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 seen to protrude anteriorly or volarly sometimes it impinges on the flexors and they put these flexors at risk so this was a diagram given by me to the to help the surgeon that this is how the plate is there and he needs to remove the plate and repair the partial tear of the fpl next is a distal radius fracture which is healed but the patient has pain and crepitus along the dorsal aspect of his wrist and distal forearm and there is painful thumb extension so typically what happens is when you have a distal radius fracture in a distal radius plate they put the screws from the volar aspect and the tip screw tip of the screws they come from the dorsal aspect so these this is one such screw going into the substance of the ecrb and is not it's a painful extension of the wrist and the is uh, the these two screws the one which is distal here and other which is proximally located here is kind of impinging into the ecrb tendon that's a proximal one so when you palpate while doing the scan you can actually feel the crepitus this was the painful impingement of the epl by the screw and this was kind of almost undergoing a partial thickness tear and maybe in a few months if the patient waits it will undergo a full thickness tear so distal radius fractures post healing the plates sometimes are notorious and put these tendons at risk so once the work of the plate is done and if the patient is getting problems like these it's better to do an ultrasound just quickly check on the tendons at risk and tell the surgeon that you need to remove the plate now next is a uh, case where this patient had come with a lump in her along her thena eminence if you can see here and also it was protruding to the first web space and there was another lump which was seen protruding in the space between the third and the fourth metacarpals there was no sensory motor deficit on the ultrasound evaluation it was clearly a lipoma which was seen in the palm now our job was to tell the surgeon that this yes this is a lipoma but tell the relationships of the lipoma to the adjacent neurovascular muscular structures so the lipoma was seen into the in the thena eminence and going all the way into the gutter lifting up the flexors and the neurovascular bundles and then through the space between the third and the met fourth metacarpals going into the lifting up the dorsal interosseous and going into the uh, dorsal aspect of the palm so that was the lipoma in the uh, thena in the thena region and it was kind of uh, in the intermuscular plane it was uh, splaying the uh, thena muscles then you can see the radial digital nerve to the index finger and the ulnar digital nerve to the thumb going on to the surface of the mass 
splaying the two heads of adductor pollicis and then going lifting up the dorsal entrosteus and the extensors going into the third web space the second web space you can see the entire dorsal entrosteus and then and then you can give a diagram to the surgeon like this that this is how the lipoma goes lifting up the flexors and the neurovascular bundles that's the fpl there the two neurovascular bundles to the thumb and the uh, index finger so that the surgeon gets a complete road map where to where to incise and where, and from where to remove the entire lump so this was the impression given by me which clearly tells gives the surgeon a nice road map with the diagram so that was the uh, so the surgeon was told to incise from the flexor aspect and take care of the digital nerves first and then enucleate the complete lipoma without in uh, putting a, giving an incision on the dorsal aspect as well so the patient did well immediately post surgery next is a middle aged dog with a painless hard lump in his left thumb so this is the left thumb in the short axis that's the fpl tendon and uh, neurovascular bundles on either side let's see this movie so that's the radial digital nerve and artery fpl tendon proximal phalanx of thumb that's the a2 pulley and then you see this nice hard lump and the nerve going on top of the lump the artery going on the side of the lump and it is kind of scalloping the phalanx there going on the anterior aspect of the fpl but it is not involving the fpl sheath and neither it's going into the ip joint of the thumb so classical giant cell tumor and then you can see the vascularity the supply by the radial digital artery and this is how the diagram was given to the surgeon that yes it was on the radial aspect lifting up the radial digital nerve the artery going on the side of it and supplying it and kind of scalloping the proximal phalanx shaft so the surgeon first of all take to care of the radial neurovascular bundle lifted it to the ulnar side then he could he, he could enucleate the entire giant cell tumor from the tendon uh, which was sitting over the tendon sheath and that you can see the fpl in the gutter there next is a young girl with a painless soft swelling in the uh, left middle finger so this is the uh, lesion isoechoic soft well encapsulated lesion on sitting on the volar and ulnar aspect of the dip joint short axis you can see that's the fdp the a4 pulley uh draining vein coming from the uh, medial aspect of the uh, lateral aspect of the lesion and that's the ulnar neurovascular bundle which is sitting on the under surface of the lesion so when you that's the uh, lesion, uh, draining vein proximal to the uh, lesion and when you see just see this movie file and then you can appreciate the whole process the draining vein proximal to the lesion you come ahead then you start seeing this mass there and that's the ulnar neurovascular bundle on the ulnar side of the flexors and you can see that it goes through the deeper portion of the lesion again there compress release compress free so you can compress the draining veins compress the lesion so this shows a lot of movements inside so these look like vascular spaces septa in between so this looks like a slow flow venous malformation typical hemangioma and you can see that digital artery and the nerve going through the deepest portion of the lesion supply from the multiple feeders from the ulnar digital artery and then you see you do compression release on color doppler and you can see that those slow flow vascular spaces fill up with color confirming that yes this is a venous malformation and then you can give a diagram like this which helps the surgeon to know that it's a well encapsulated lesion he'll be able to excise it but he'll have to take care of the ulnar neurovascular bundle and the draining vein here while he is excising it he doesn't have to enter the flexor sheath because it is external to the flexor sheath next case where there is a severe pain in the ulnar nail bed there and the patient just is not able to allowing to touch lot of paresthesia and pain 
So symptoms of a typical glomus, scan done over the dorsal aspect of the nail bed. You can see that's the nail in the midline. You go more on the radial side. You don't see anything in the nail bed, but you come on the ulnar side and you see a lesion there. So that's the hypoechoic solid lesion around seven millimeters distal to the DIP joint along the ulnar aspect of the nail bed. In the short axis, again, you see that area. That's the lesion. No lesion on this side. That's the nail and this is the nail bed. Quite painful for the patient. Then on Doppler, you can see brilliant intense vascularity in the nail bed, which is normal. Go on the radial side, you don't see anything, but then you come on the ulnar side and you can see this lesion showing nice vascularity. So that was the lesion, which was around 3.6 by 2.3 centimeters in the short axis, showing vascularity located six millimeters distal to the DIP joint. And that was the roadmap for the surgeon that yes, this is a glomus tumor and this is located at so-and-so place. You'll be able to excise it nicely. So that was the planned incision by the surgeon with the tourniquet. That was the glomus on incising the nail bed. And finally, delivery of the glomus and instant relief to the patient post-surgery. Then we are doing this kind of uh, cases where you have the syndactylies and we trace the tendon apparatus. We trace the digital circulation through our 20 megahertz probe, which uh, helps in kind of separating. We give a diagram like this to the surgeon so that he's able to know that which arteries are prominent along which web spaces or along the digits and how he will be able to separate these fingers in a stage-wise process. This was the case where we had to draw on the patient and this is the post-op recovery. He's able to flex his fingers nicely after the thumb uh, hand has become more and more functional. So summarizing, ultrasound can give us so much information and even much more than other modalities which help us in giving a lot of information extra. And this is when we need to see soft tissue structures dynamically, which is so good with ultrasound. So with the correct equipment and using the right frequency probe, uh, we can give a kind of a anatomical roadmap or a Google map to the surgeon. So important thing is whenever we take feedbacks from the surgeons, especially operative feedbacks, where we are right, where we have gone wrong. It really helps us to focus on our examination and give a more productive report. Thank you for your patient hearing. Fantastic, Ashwin. Uh, it's not a Google map. It's looked like Ashwin maps. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so brilliant and uh, the dynamic scans and your post-operative correlations are really fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us today. What to go wrong? Any questions? Uh, no, I think uh, Ashwin sir has this habit of uh, teaching the residents to draw figures with all musculoskeletal ultrasound. And it really helps the surgeons to understand because ultrasound is a dynamic scan. And such types of drawings really help us, especially in musculoskeletal and Doppler things. Uh, I think we can move on to the next speaker, Sarita. Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Wong. Uh, he's head and senior consultant radiologist at Sinkang Hospital, Singapore. He's clinical associate professor at Duke uh, NUS Graduate Medical School. He is associated uh, with the College of Radiologists, Singapore as a treasurer and the Asian Musculoskeletal Society as uh, the president elect. He is uh, associated with the Society of Imaging Informatics in Medicine uh, in USA and the Global Outreach Committee co-chair for the International Skeletal, uh, and he's a member of the International Skeletal Society. He has over 40 co-authored papers, and his interest lies in advanced imaging of articular cartilage, spine radiology, and trauma radiology. He's the recipient of the Outstanding Clinic, uh, Clinician Award for 2022, and the Singh Health GCEO Excellence Award. We are really thrilled to have you, Dr. Stephen, today. Uh, over to you, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, let me share screen. Okay, right. Um, I must admit that um, presentation on the ultrasound of the hand was superb um, and mind boggling. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the scoliotic spine, uh, tips and tricks for reporting. These are my disclosures. And happy Father's Day to everybody. So scoliosis is actually an incidental finding for most times like health screening chest x-rays or patients being worked up for knee or A where they just happen to do uh, a pelvic x-ray to look at the, uh, whether there's any pelvic tilt or limb length discrepancy. And then you notice there's some degenerative changes in the spine and you do a whole spine x-ray and you notice a presence of a scoliosis. Right, so what is a scoliosis? So it's literally just lateral spine curvature with a cop angle 10 degrees or more within the coronal plane. But you, we all know that the spine actually is affected in all three dimensions. Uh, it's a pretty dynamic uh, structure as well, uh, as you can see on these 3D VRT images. Um, so it's not just the coronal plane that's affected, it is the sagittal plane and the axial plane because there's a degree of rotation and tilt uh, of the uh, vertebral bodies uh, and all these structures affected by it. So you can see the deformity of the ribs and their, in terms of their alignment. And there are two stages to scoliosis. Number one is curve initiation and later on progression. So um, there's the huter volkmann law where the bone growth in skeletal immature spine is retarded by growth plate compression and accelerated by growth plate tension. So you have compression at the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies and while well, distraction at the posterior aspects. And once you have an axial rotatory force, you actually change the dynamics of the spine. Uh, and this leads to eventual development of uh, scoliosis in some patients. So there is um, multiple etiological causes, but predominantly uh, idiopathic accounts uh, for 80% of them. So what did you allow for on the x-rays? Perhaps a you know, segmentation anomaly, like in this case where you have a T3 hemivertebrae, um, nicely demonstrated on the CT scans, or you have a tethered cord uh, or low-lying cord uh, with a syringomyelia, uh, resulting in a scoliosis compensating because of the uh, shortened position required. So how do you report? First, you draw the central sacral vertical line, uh, which is a line that biceps in the uh, line through the eyelid crest. You have a perpendicular line, you must be perpendicular. And then you can see whether the deviation uh, from the central midline is, okay. And by nomenclature wise, dextroscoliosis is anything on the right side after the central uh, sacral vertical line and levoscoliosis is anything on the left side. And I generally try and avoid saying concave to the right or left. Uh, it's preferable uh, for this, uh, amongst the surgeon for you to say convex to the right or left. Then you look at the apex of the curve. Uh, the apex basically where the greatest rotation or furthest deviation from the vertebral column. Then you determine what the end vertebrae are. Uh, proximal and distal. And this is what you use to measure the cop angle. And we'll get back to that. Um, neutral vertebrae are just those that show the rotation of tilt um, and where the pedicles are in the normal symmetric position. Uh, and stable vertebrae are those that are not affected at all. Right, so the cop angle is the angle at the intersection between two lines, right? So we have a magnifying view. Okay, um, uh, uppermost is parallel to the upper amplate of the superior end vertebrae, and lowermost is at the parallel to the lower amplate of the inferior uh, end vertebrae. Um, and you just measure this. You can actually extend the line outwards and do it this way, or you can do a line that's tangential to the two original lines and get the cop angle this way. Uh, most of us nowadays with wrist packs capability, we just use a cop angle function within our packs to measure. Uh, 
the Kobango is subject to uh, multiple factors like diurnal variation or five degrees, um, positional variations between x-rays. Uh, it may not be the same uh, on different occasions when you come for x-ray, depending on how you position the patients. Um, it is different in the prone patient uh, versus supine, and this is of importance for the surgeons when the patient is late prone for surgery. Um, and you have to take into account the 3D and nature of scoliosis when positioning the patient as well. And curve progression is considered if uh, the curve angle changes by five degrees or more. Okay, so whether it's hand drawn on a hard copy or on PEX is now uh, realized to be similar accuracy, but you know, do refer to the previous x-rays if you can, the earliest x-rays possible, right? And when you do the cop, cop angle, always use the same end vertebrae uh, so that you can maintain accurately and consistency. Um, the surgeons and the radiologists tend to disagree on uh, the end vertebral uh, levels. Um, so you may, when you're doing the reporting, you may want to do this, uh, this list where you take the cop angle measurement from. And surgeons normally will flip the, uh, their x-rays uh, vertically uh, so that they're looking at from the, almost from the back of the patient to mimic the physical examination. So what about the lateral uh, spine x-ray? So anyway, let me talk about the C7 plumb line first, okay? So the C7 plumb line is a line that goes down from C7, down parallel to the lateral edge of the radiograph, okay? Um, on the frontal x-ray, it shows a coronal balance, which is the difference between the plumb line and the central uh, uh, sacral vertical line. On this, uh, okay, um, so this is what the uh, plumber's uh, line is. But on the lateral, uh, you can take, you can do the line down from C7, central part of the C7 vertebral body, uh, vertically down. And by right, it should actually try bicep through the posterior superior corner of S1. If it's uh, in front, it's positive. If it's uh, posterior, it's considered negative. And this has uh, implications for the patient's um, balance and uh, spinal stability. Okay, and the surgeon always tries and correct this to neutral as much as possible. And how do you determine the primary and secondary curve? Okay, there are multiple types of curve. The major curve or primary curve is literally the largest normal curve you have, and it's the first to develop it. Okay, the minor and secondary curve. I'm oh, sorry uh, for the typo there. Are smaller curves that develop late, later on, um, basically to try and compensate for the imbalance that the patient has in the spine and also to reposition the patient's head. Um, so the body tries to recorrect itself as much as possible. Um, these are not the, similar to, but not the same as what we call it structural curve. Okay, so structural curve is that uh, the uh, primary curve that's not corrected on its lateral bending. So you can see this one, uh, when you bend to the other side, it corrects, uh, straightens a little bit, but when you bend to the right side, on this one, it bends to the, uh, it, no, it doesn't improve at all. So this is a structural curve um, and you maintain a cup angle of 25 degrees or, or more. Okay. So as I said, you need to do progression. Um, so you can actually, patients are basically fall out radiographically almost uh, every uh, three to 12 months, depending on the degree of progression. So in this, case, uh, this patient um, based, didn't show significant progression, so they only came back almost every, uh, every year. And you just follow until when skeletal maturity is reached. Okay, um, so cop angle of under 30 degrees uh, usually is, is uh, consistent with uh, stop progressing. If it's between 30 to 50 degrees, uh, they may uh, progress an additional 10 to 15 percent, 15 degrees per year. Um, those with over 50 degrees cop angle, um, they have higher risk of back pain and cardiopulmonary complications if there is significant distortion of the ribcage. Um, those with cop angle 50 to 70 degrees, uh, the progression actually decreases because you know it's already pretty bad. Um, so these are the factors that are affected with uh, associated with curve progression. And in young females, the men are status. So when is um, skeletal maturity achieved? 
So the surgeons use the RISA classification, which looks at the ossification of the alia crest uh, going from lateral to medial. Uh, in actuality, it's actually anterior to lateral uh, to posterior, but you know, on the radiograph, it goes from, it goes from uh, the lateral to medial. Um, so uh, a reason not, there is no identi uh, identifiable ossification, so it's still unossified. And one is about the the anterior or lateral two fifth, uh, twenty five percent is uh, ossified already. Uh, at two, uh, the lateral fifty percent has ossified, um, and so on and so forth. And at once you get a reason five is complete fusion, but not as applicable in boys because uh, boys starts ossification slightly later than uh, girls. Okay, you also need to consider the degree of lateral body rotation and tilt, uh, okay? So once you have a tilt on the plane X-ray frontal view, um, this affects what the lateral view looks like, okay? Um, so in the frontal view, you can have a tilt uh, secondary to the scoliosis. Um, you have, have a look at the pedicles and the spinous processes to see whether there is any rotation uh, or whether they're still on fast to, uh, to you. Okay, but on the lateral view, once there is any degree of tilt or rotation of the rural bodies, then you can see that the end plates, rather than becoming one single line, it actually becomes almost like an elliptical uh, appearance. And that actually makes it difficult to assess the degree of uh, change in the vertebral bodies. Okay, and there are various methods to measure the vertebral rotation. One is the cup method, which I've listed here, where you divide the vertebral body into six sections in the uh, frontal X-ray, and then where the spinous process is determines the rate of rotation. Okay. There are a lot of other uh, rotation methods, like in Nash and Moore, we looked at the positioning of the pedicles, okay? And Pedrio, which uses a normogram, and then, and then it, assigns it to where the position of the pedicles is. Um, this, however, has been shown to have a slightly higher degree of inaccuracy than, than the rest. Um, Stokes uses a formula to determine the rotation angle, uh, and it's actually quite difficult to use, and I actually do not use uh, Stokes or Pedrio, but I may use a Nash more at times. Um, I actually prefer using a CT scan to look at rotations, or even MRI. Um, and it's much better. Uh, so this is the common one where you, you take the angle between the anterior vertical line, which is AB, and the actual midpoint midline onto the vertebral body, okay? Um, this is another method to more or less measure the same angle. Um, and actually it's a little bit more tedious to do. So I actually just use the error of double uh, method. So what would Stephen do for cases like this? So let's follow a case. So this is a female patient with um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, and we'll follow this patient from uh, when she's 12 years old to 20 years old. And as mentioned, the radiographic surveillance for progression, um, you can see that 13, they put her into a brace, okay? Just to try and arrest the progression of deformity. Um, at 13.5, almost 14, they took the brace away because she's uh, supposed to be fairly stable. And then, and then they follow her closely for a while, almost every six months. Um, and it looks like it remains uh, reasonably stable by 14, uh, almost 14.3 years. Um, you can see that the deviation from the mid central midline is, has increased compared to when she was in the brace. Okay, but then the, she didn't uh, go back into the brace and they just kept, followed her for an, a years later. Uh, the deviation is about the same. Um, there is mild progression at 17 and at 19 when uh, she has a RISA 5 in terms of skeletal maturity, uh, then, then she came back for final review. Um, Okay, so you did the central sacral vertical line to evaluate the uh, obliquity and the deviation from mean, uh, the C7 uh, plumb line to see uh, how offset the central of the spine is, the upper central of the spine is, 
And then you evaluate the uh, ilia crest and see, and in this case, she is a visa five for, with full ossification of the ilia crest. Um, lateral view shows a, a negative uh, alignment in that she has a slight increase in low doses uh, and well, perhaps a mild kyphosis to try and compensate for the increased low doses that she has. And then side bending, uh, right and left lateral side bending radiographs to assess for whether there is any sort of flattening or reduction or reversal of the curvature and there wasn't a significant amount. Okay, but and then at 19 years old, she has pain and she has radiculopathy symptoms. And then she was eventually worked out for surgery, at which time MRI was done. So if you look at the MR, you can actually see the degree of scoliosis. And MR is actually really good for showing whether the disc are stressed, uh, whether there is any asymmetrical displaced narrowing at, any, at the point or the apex of the, the uh, curve, and where the position of the nerve roots are, the coda, quina, and the conus. Uh, and this is brilliantly demonstrated on the axials. We can see that uh, at L1, uh, most of the coda aquina is actually to the left of midline. Um, and, um, but then they go, eventually go back to a normal uh, posterior central location uh, as the curvature uh, re uh, reduces back to normal. Uh, this has uh, importance for the surgeons, uh, and you actually do need to tell the surgeon, particularly the core. Uh, where the uh, nerve roots or the cord is lies in relation to the spinal canal in case they want to operate at that level and they want to do a vasectomy. Okay, and I'll put an S1 in just for uh, benefit. So anyway, she went for surgery uh, with a lateral approach and then this is a subportic brace uh, postoperative. Okay, so here's another case. Uh, so basically you have to, to keep an eye out on position of the conus and the nerve roots within the spinal canal. So in this patient with a scoliosis, uh, that is a liver scoliosis uh, with an apex at uh, T12 L1 uh, level, um, so it doesn't, re doesn't really give you a clear picture of where the uh, conus is or the coda quina is, but if you look at the axial, it's mostly gathered towards the uh, right uh, half of the spinal canal. Uh, and it is because the cord and the kind of tries to follow the shortest vertical route possible. And it's something that you have to keep in mind and inform patients in case, uh, inform doctors in case the uh, patient is going for surgery. Right, so, so next case of what will Stephen do for this? So this is a 71 year old female uh, with a L1 uh, level myelomeningal cell and severe kyphoscoliosis. You can see she's uh, chronic scoliosis, uh, osteopenia, significant kyphoscoliosis as well with marked rib cage deformity. Um, and you can see the degree of rotation of the visual bodies at the thoracolumbar region. Um, and do note where the myelomeningal seal is, the locations of the coda aquina, because uh, it moves from one side to the other. Uh, this is a T1 coronal rather than a T2 coronal. Uh, at, uh, there was uh, the standard at the previous institution I was working at. Uh, my current department now does a T2 coronal with uh, non fat set and fat set uh, sequences. So, weight bearing low dose um, chromium CT scans have a role. Okay, so um, there's a voice teaching after the thoracic spine and lumbar spine radiographs. Um, and they're generally microdose or low dose. Um, so it gives uh, a single acquisition uh, in the frontal and lateral planes. Uh, patient must remain motionless for this. Uh, so you have to pick, select the patients very carefully. Um, newer software enables you to do a 3D volume acquisition with uh, MPR capability and eventual 3D VRT. Uh, I must say, I'm very impressed by the images from the, the EOS system. I would love to have one in my department, but I don't have space and money for it. Uh, and this is what EOS uh, uh, image qualities are like, and they are actually uh, pretty uh, functional and, uh, and not as, you know, and don't lose out to plain radiographs. And actually you have very good soft tissue resolution as well. And on this, you can actually see the degree of rotation of the body uh, in terms of the fact that one person is, uh, more slightly more posterior to the other side and at the back uh, where the rib hump is as well. Um, and 
and when the patient is in the brace, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, the images are just as good. There is not as much uh, metal artifact uh, with the EOS system as there is on radiographs or CT scan. Okay. So management of scoliosis is a whole lecture and so um, number one is basically you observe the patient um, those who are skeletally immature uh, for the orthopedic uh, adolescent orthopedic scoliosis who are skeletally immature um, uh, with a cop angle of uh, less than 20 degrees or skeletally mature with cop angle of less than 30 degrees, you just wash them. Okay, you may have to you know, bring them back uh, now and then for repeat x ray. Uh, you put a brace in to try and avoid a delayed surgery um, and try and return. So reduce the rate of progression as much as possible. Um, however, um, if the is only applicable for patients who have cop angle or 20 to 30 degrees and with uh, minimal progression between, okay. You may have to consider surgery. Um, surgery appears to prevent curve progression um, and try to achieve solid bone fusion of uh, the affected segments. Uh, you try to operate on as little uh, portions of the spine as possible, uh, and with the aim to correct uh, the curve, uh, try and restore the trunk front uh, balance restoration, uh, putting the C7 above, returning C7 to above the mid sacral level as much as possible, okay? And these are the thresholds you look at, 45 degrees or more. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the scoliotic spine x-rays can be pretty daunting to report. Um, you need to try and determine which is the major or primary curve versus the minor or secondary curves. Um, and primary curves is the largest, the one with the largest curvature. Um, try and do the central sacral vertical line and the C7 plumb line to, to help you assess the variety. Um, tell the surgeon where the apex is, determine where the end vertebrae is and put it into the report. And then you go and measure the cop angle. And then you want to look for other factors like whether there's pelvic tilt or limb leg discrepancy that contributes to the pelvic tilt. Um, and you try and assess rotations on the CT on MR. Um, on a, if you have a CT on MR, try and note the positioning of the spinal cord, the conus or the coda quina within the spinal canal uh, as that has major have implications for surgery. And generally standing or weight bearing x-rays are preferred. Uh, in all instance. These are the references. Uh, these are three very, very good articles uh, that uh, I found very helpful in compiling this talk. And thank you very much for uh, listening and I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stephen Wong. Uh, this lecture was really very informative, especially for us uh, who don't practice much in scoliosis and when one such case comes up, we just have to scramble through the articles and everything, but it was very precise and how to report uh, the scoliotic spine. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to uh, remind our uh, listeners that we have a feedback form. Uh, you can fill up the feedback form uh, so that we may improve uh, our webinars for the future. And as soon as you fill the feedback form, you'll be able to access your certificate of participation. Also a few listeners who want to uh, again visit the entire webinar, it will be available for the Vidocto platform of AOSR for the next two weeks. Those who are not able to attend it can also attend it. Fill the feedback form, get the certificate and attend the webinar. Uh, moving on to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Harun Gupta. Uh, Dr. Harun sir is a consultant musculoskeletal radiologist with the Leeds Teaching Hospital. He's honorary senior lecturer with the University of Leeds. He is member of Council of BSSR, advisory editor for Clinical Radiology Journal. He's member of the Ultrasound and Interventional Committee, ESSR. He's member of the ISS and the ISS Refresher Program Promotion Committee. Uh, he's advisory board member for Musculoskeletal Society in India and advisory editor for the Journal of the Musculoskeletal Society. Uh, he has over 60 publications and book chapters to his credit. His interest is in uh, is the faculty of national and international meetings and courses. 
He's expert in all aspects of MSK radiology with some specialty interest in soft tissue sarcomas and their intervention. He's the recipient of the RCR Travel Bursary Prize, poster prize in BM US meeting and the best SHO presentation. We are really uh, grateful to have you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Harold Gupta. Thank you very much, uh, Gorang. Uh, so I just want to make sure, can you see my screen, everybody? Yes, sir. yes, sir. So first of all, yeah, my screen is visible. Thank you. So first of all, a big thank you to the ASOR, AOSR, uh, Dr. Evelyn Ho, Dr. Vara Prasad, and Dr. Gorang for uh, the kind introduction. And over the next 30 minutes or so, the topic that I've been given is imaging in seronegative spondyloarthropathy. So the way I have divided the lecture is in this lecture, what I want you to do is at the end of 30 minutes that you have some key concepts which are uh, you know which help you in making your diagnosis and improving your report so what we will do is we will look at the types of spondyloarthropathy we will look at key concepts which i've already mentioned we will look at the diagnostic criteria which have been laid down by various societies and then we will look at the imaging diagnostic criteria, particularly the MRI, as to what constitutes a normal positive MRI criteria. Then we will also look at few actual cases of spondyloarthropathy and then few pitfalls in the spondyloarthropathy. So starting with the types of spondyloarthropathy, I mean, this is an autoimmune condition. We don't know what exactly causes it typically affects the young people and genetic factors have also been told to play a very important role in this. And that's why it's quite important that we often do HLA-B27 testing in these people. So it's an inflammatory arthritis. The ankylosing spondylitis, which is the axial type, it predominantly involves the sacroiliac joints and the spine. And then we have the peripheral types. The peripheral types are those where there is involvement of upper and lower limbs. There is dactylitis, anthocytis, involvement of the peripheral small joints and the bigger joints, and tendonitis. So some patients may experience both mixed features of axial and, and peripheral types. So coming to the Similar, I know this slide looks quite a lot of things happening here, but I've already mentioned we are looking at predominantly axial involvement, predominantly peripheral involvement. So in the ankylosing spondylitis, there is predominantly axial involvement, whereas in the arthritis, such as the psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel associated arthritis, reactive arthritis, and the uveitis associated arthritis, there is predominantly peripheral involvement. But you know, they can be overlap and they can be mixed features. So there was a terminology which was used in the past, which was called as non-radiographic spondyloarthropathy. And I will speak about this terminology later in this lecture. And, and this is one terminology which was used at the time when we were mainly relying on the plain radiographs and not on the MRI for diagnosis. Now, we, we all, I'm sure most of you are involved with imaging of spondyloarthropathy, and we all come across a number of problems when we're imaging spondyloarthropathy. And as we've already looked, it's a broad spectrum of conditions. There are axial forms, peripheral forms, uh, involvement of various parts of the body can happen. And because of this, the diagnosis sometimes can be difficult. The other problem is it involves younger individuals, and often these people have non-radicular back pain. And because it's non-radicular back pain, it's uh, you know, young individuals, it's often blamed on mechanical symptoms or muscular pain. And in a number of uh, studies, they have found that the diagnostic delay is, can be up to seven years before the patient's actually diagnosed uh, with spondyloarthropathy. The other problem is what do we call as a normal sacroiliac joint? And because sacroiliac joints can be affected by degenerative changes, apart from inflammation, they can be affected in women because of post-pregnancy changes. And in athletic individuals, they, you know, you're quite athletic, you know, sportsmen, uh, they can be affected by, again, mechanical changes in young people. And then a very big problem, which could be a full lecture, is imaging in immature sacroiliac joint, which can have very varied appearances. So the, these are all the challenges which we face 
uh, when you're trying to diagnose inflammatory spondyloarthropathy. Now coming on to the challenges is this was a paper which was published uh, by one of the authors from Leeds. Uh, this is Journal of Rheumatology. And what they did was they surveyed about 700 radiologists. So a large number of radiologists. And what they found was there was huge variation in the practice and knowledge of the radiologists. So only one in four radiologists knew what is the actual definition of a positive criteria on MRI for diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy. What they also found was that 17 of the 18 references were published in rheumatology journals and not radiology journals. So important thing from this paper is that the radiologists and the rheumatologists, they are speaking different languages. So the language is spoken by rheumatologists, not understood by the radiologists. And the rheumatologists, what they are trying to see in their criteria is the radiologists are unaware of all that. So that's very important, uh, you know, landmark paper, um, which paved way for trying to improve uh, working together of the radiologists and rheumatologists. Coming to the diagnostic criteria made by the various societies, again, this is making things difficult because we've got the modified New York criteria, the European society criteria, the AMOR criteria, and most recently we have the ASAS criteria. So for, for purposes of this talk, uh, you know, the one which is most commonly followed nowadays is the ASAS criteria. And, and this, in this one, the most important thing that happened is that there was huge impetus put on MRI imaging and not just plain film imaging. So the, the first key concept from this particular criteria is to, when you look at this criteria is that the key concept is that we do not need, uh, you know, we do not need MRI or any form of imaging for diagnosis. So the diagnosis is based on clinical, laboratory and imaging parameters. And if you look at this, if there is HLA B27 positive, just two other SPA criteria, which are all of these, are enough to make a diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy. Imaging cannot be viewed in isolation. So if there is sacroidiotis on imaging, it needs to have one more criteria for diagnosis before you can call it spondyloarthropathy. So very important to remember that because when we're reporting imaging, sometimes we get very worried whether we might be overcalling or undercalling, but do remember that there are a number of other features which are very important in diagnosis, the clinical and the laboratory parameters. The next very quickly we will look at the, I'm sure most people know is we understand very quickly is the anatomy of the sacroiliac joint, quite a complex joint. And the joint extends from S1 to S3 level and it's an oblique coronal orientation. And this part, which is the yellow part, this is the fibrocartilage part of the joint. And the part posteriorly, the blue part, this part, this part, this is the ligamentous part of the joint. And for hypothetically, we can divide it into three parts, which is the superior, middle, and the inferior part. So the superior and the middle parts have got both fibrocartilage and ligamentous parts, whereas the inferior part here, this typically has only fibrocartilage. We have to also remember, as already mentioned, it extends only from the S1 to the S3 level. So when we look at this imaging, this was a paper which was uh, published by Professor Griffith. So I've used some images from that, very good paper. And what it shows is, uh, you know, the CT, if you look at the CT, and this is the yellow part is the fibrocartilage part. This is the ligamentous part. So fibrocartilage part, ligamentous part, and the lower part, this is the whole fibrocartilage part. And I put a plain film along with it. So when we're looking at plain film, the inferior third, this is all fibrocartilage part. This is the anterior part of the joint. This is the posterior part of the joint. The margins get blurred on the plain film in the superior and the inferior part of the joint where the diagnosis on plain films can be comparatively difficult as compared to a CT or MR imaging modality. So that's why I do remember on the plain film, we see four joints, one, two, three, and four. And, and these are because we have the anterior joints, the posterior joint, 
the uh, posterior joint and the anterior joint again. So just to give you the example here, this is exactly what we're seeing on the MR, where this is the anterior part of the joint, and this at the posterior is this is the posterior part of the joint. Next, we uh, look at the MRI anatomy again. When we're trying to do the MRI, when we do the MRI, we always do the MRI in the oblique coronal orientation. So this is the orientation in which MRI is performed. So the very anterior part, this predominantly has the fibrocartilage part uh, on this. The next is when we go posteriorly from anterior to posterior, there is some, uh, some ligamentous part and then the fibrocartilage part here. This is the fibrocartilage part of the joint. And at the very back, at the very back here, this is all the ligamentous part of the joint. So this is important to understand uh, how we image the MRI. So I've already mentioned about the plane film. The most reliable part on the plane film when we're looking for changes is the inferior half of the joint or the inferior third of the joint, where on this one, if you look, this part has got lost its clear margins. There is sclerosis along it in the anterior part. And again here, and again here there is sclerosis and this has lost its margin. So if you see any changes in the inferior third of the joint, that is very, very specific for sacroiliitis on plane radiograph. This is another example where the patient's got changes, predominantly sclerosis and irregularity in the inferior middle, inferior half and in the middle part of the joint. And what we're seeing here, these are the paraglenoid sulcus, sulcus. These are very normal appearances. These are typically seen in multiparous women and they're normal, but this irregularity and sclerosis, and this is not completely normal. So this has got features of sacroiliitis. This is box standard sacroiliitis, advanced changes where the margins are lost completely and there is sclerosis, extensive sclerosis and erosive changes on both sides of the joint. Again, as when you look, you can see more specific changes being in the lower third of the joint. Now coming to what uh, you know, imaging we should be performed. MRI is the gold standard of imaging for diagnosis of seronegative spondyloarthropathy. And when we are imaging MRI, though we say sacroiliac joint, we have to remember that we have to image both the spine and the sacroiliac joints. So we already looked at it. We have to perform the imaging in oblique coronal orientation. And uh, you know this, this is the typical oblique orientation in which this is performed. And the sequences that we perform is we perform T1 sequences and we perform the fluid sensitive sequences. So this is the T1 sequence. And in leads more recently, what we have done is we have started performing the T1 vibe sequences. So this is quite useful for looking at the anatomy uh, in these patients. The next thing we look at is whether we should be giving contrast to these patients or not. So whether, you know, it's important whether we should be giving gadolinium contrast. So we have to remember that when we give gadolinium contrast, most importantly, what happens is there is synovitis, capsulitis, and anthocytis enhancement in these patients when we give gadolinium contrast. But is it essential? No, it's optional. And we certainly don't use it in our practice. The reason for that is that when these patients have spondyloarthropathic inflammatory changes, they will always have presence of bone marrow edema, which is very specific for spondyloarthropathy. So when we come to these patients, so we, we have to look at how much, you know, in the MRI involvement is, you know, how much we should involve, you know, whether when we look at the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine, then we look at the various changes. In, in leads, we have a protocol where we perform the thoracic and the lumbar spine imaging in these patients. The next we look at the sagittal scanning in the spine and what level of spine we should cover. So we already mentioned we should cover the thoracic and the lumbar spine in these patients. And when we do sagittal imaging, it's very important that we include the costovertebral and the costotransverse joints in these patients. So when we're looking at sacroiliitis diagnosis, uh, we, look, we look at the terminology where there is active inflammation and active inflammation is in the form of presence of BMO or bone marrow edema. And this is the most specific. 
the capsulitis, cyanovitis, and enthesitis may be present, but presence of bone marrow edema is most important for diagnosis. And in these patients, they may have development of chronic inflammatory changes. And when I, what I mentioned by chronic inflammatory changes is uh, that these patients will have established structural changes or what is called as a chronic changes. And these are best seen on T1 imaging. And these can be in the form of sclerosis, erosive changes, sclerosis, presence of fat deposition, and bony ankylosis. So when we speak rheumatological language and we see, when we say that the patient's got bone marrow edema, that means these are active changes. Whereas when we say that the patient has presence of structural changes, that means that the chronic changes have already set in. So, uh, you know, we looked at the sacroiliac joint anatomy and uh, the most commonly involved is the lower part of the joint or the iliac aspect of the joint. As in these patients, this is the areas which can be most commonly involved. The next we look at what exactly constitutes the positive criteria for spondyloarthropathy. So for this, we look at the signal changes which is seen in these patients. So as a part of the diagnostic criteria, if there is one signal change only, this has to be seen on two different slices. And typically, this should be at least one centimeter in size. Whereas the patient may can have two different areas of signal changes, and they may be approximately one centimeter in size. And this is also adequate as a positive criteria for diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy. So remember that very important is when we're getting confused with different information, remember the positive diagnostic criteria of MRI. If it's sig single signal change, at least one centimeter, it should be on two different slices. If there is on one slice, two areas of signal changes, approximately one centimeter in size, that is also considered as positive criteria. Now looking at the spine positive criteria, what, what should we say is positive in spine? So if we see corner changes, which is anterior or posterior, which could be active or which could be fatty changes, we should, then, we should see them in at least three different areas or three different vertebral levels before we call it's a positive finding in the spine. Now we all understand the changes we see in the spine. Most people have heard about them quite popular. Uh, you know, anterior, posterior corner changes, aseptic spondylodiscitis, arthritis of the various joints, which is costovertebral, costotransfers, facet joints, and then anthocytis and, you know, the spinal ligaments. And then finally, syndesmophyte formation and ankylosis. And do remember that there are often pitfalls because some of these areas, you know, where the degenerative changes may be mistaken for inflammation or vice versa. Should we be imaging pelvis in these patients with sacroiliac joint protocol? Well, this is part of our protocol and we do find it very helpful. So what we do in our protocol now is we run an axial T2 fat saturated sequence of the pelvis, just one particular sequence as a part of the sacroiliac joint protocol. And what it does is, is what they, if you look at this paper here, uh, you know, in this, what they found is that approximately you know, 24% patients do not have any, they have changes of sacroiliitis in these patients. So very important what happens is when these changes happen in key locations that help us come to a conclusive diagnosis. So sometimes we're not exactly sure what the diagnosis is, but when these changes are present in key location, it helps us come to a conclusive diagnosis. So when we look at uh, this particular, uh, you know, what findings are happening. So the patient has disease trigger and that leads to clinical onset of symptoms. And then the patient comes in, they have changes, they have clinical changes, they have laboratory criteria changes, but they have normal X-ray findings. So in these patients, the X-rays are normal. By the time we have the MRI, there are present of changes. And this is one condition where there are no changes on the X-ray, but there are changes on the MR imaging. Increasingly, we use the term non-radiographic spondyloarthropathy. So when we look at this chart, you know, criteria, in the past, 
what we were doing is the x-rays used to be the one which were getting done predominantly late in the disease or early in the disease. And that's why there was always a diagnostic delay in picking up spondyloarthropathy. But nowadays we are able to use MRI very early and we're able to pick up spondyloarthropathy much quickly. And therefore we are able to come over this condition which was used to be called as non-radiographic spondyloarthropathy. So we've looked at the uh, current key concepts and the diagnosis. We've looked at you know, what exactly constitutes as the imaging criteria for diagnosis on MRI particularly. We've also looked at the various criteria uh, you know, on the, by the various societies, the most commonly followed criteria being the ASAS criteria. Then we've also looked at the terminologies which are used by rheumatologists and the, you know, the radiologists, such as presence of bone marrow edema or structural changes, such as structural changes when they are present, that implies that the chronic changes have already set in. And we have understood that structural changes, we should try and look more on T1 imaging uh, as compared to other imaging. Next, we very quickly look at some of the example cases. In this one, this patient was referred with low back pain where the discs height were all preserved, but there were changes in the anterior corners at multiple levels. And in this one, the patient was then recalled, was recalled for sacroiliac joint protocol imaging and demonstrated florid changes of uh, sacroiliitis and spondyloarthropathy with changes both in the spine, in the corners, and the sacroiliac joint. This is another example of a patient which came with back pain with a you know, 25 year old young patient, but he had florid changes of edema at the corners and throughout the vertebral body. And therefore the patient was recalled for sacroiliac joint imaging where all it showed was a small area of edema in the right side of the iliac aspect of the joint. But because we also do uh, imaging of the pelvis, the patient was noted to have diffuse inflammatory bowel disease and the diagnosis of enteric related spondyloarthropathy was made. So we also see here in this patient is that there is so less involvement of the sacroiliac joint as compared to involvement of the spine. This was an interesting case, a 30 year old patient which came with back pain. And at that presentation, the symptoms were all in the L3-4 level. The rest all appeared pretty, pretty normal at that time. And the patient went on to have whole spine imaging. And again, nothing particular was picked up. And because patient continued to have symptoms and end plate biopsy was performed at this level. And the patient continued to have symptoms and because the symptoms were con are continuing even after the biopsy, the patient went on to was seeing the surgeons went on to have fusion at this level. But the patient misery and symptoms continued one year post-surgery. And by the time the patient was picked up, you know, in this case, by the time patient was picked up later, it was noted the patients already got extensive changes of spondyloarthropathy and inflammation. So by the time you've already fused the patient, the patient actually had spondyloarthropathy symptoms. So it's important to remember that the patients may have isolated changes in the sacroiliac joints before making the definitive diagnosis. So they may have changes in the spine or sacroiliac joint or vice versa at the time of diagnosis. Then the other areas which can get involved is this is example uh, case where the patient had was referred for femoroacetabular impingement. The patient did have labral changes, but there was this is an arthrographic study where there was widespread synovitis in the hip joint. And looking at the corner of the imaging, patient was noted to have florid sacroiliitis. And another example of a 29-year-old patient with changes of uh, CAM type changes, there are you know, cartilage degeneration changes, and the patient was noted to have widespread inflammation in the corner of the imaging. So this is a patient which came with sternal pain. This is edematous changes at the menopreosternal joint. And 
We recalled the patient because of the changes for sacroiliac joint protocol, and the patient was noted to have widespread sacroiliac joint inflammatory changes. And these are more examples of um, what we see in, say, you know, seronegative spondyloarthropathy. This patient's got widespread tenosynovitis, tibialis posterior has got synovitis changes, and there is diffuse effusion changes. Um, and this one, there is edema and changes in the calcaneal anthesis. So if we look at how has it changed my practice. We've looked at the various key points and what, what now I have realized is over time is that we have a five point scale. So what changes we may have, the patient may have completely normal changes, changes which are probably normal, changes which are possibly normal or changes which are probably normal or completely normal. So what we have realized that these patients often do not have a single point assessment for diagnosis. So if the patient's uh, symptoms are continuing and they fall in the category of two to four, ranging from probably normal, possibly spondyloarthropathy to probably seronegative spondyloarthropathy, what is important to remember is that we might have to image these patients later, even if the patients don't have symptoms at that time. So it's not a single point diagnosis. If the patients are having continuing symptoms and they're falling in the category between two and four, then we may need to recall them and repeat the imaging. And I also briefly mentioned about trying to do the pelvic sequences. And as I mentioned, they can sometimes be helpful in, in picking up spondyloarthropathy, especially in cases where the diagnosis is not completely definitive. We will very quickly look at some of the pitfalls uh, we see in diagnosis of uh, sacroiliitis. One of the common pitfalls we see more commonly in women is the osteitis condensis, but the features are very specific. It more involves the middle and the inferior part of the joint where there is dense sclerosis dominantly affecting the ileus aspect of the joint, which is bilateral and has a triangular distribution. So this is case of typical osteitis condensins. The distribution, the joints, if you look at even here, the despite the dense sclerosis, the joint margins are all completely preserved. And then that's classical for osteitis condensins. The next common pitfall is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. And in this one, what happens is there is diffuse sclerosis, you know, there's diffuse sclerosis, there's diffuse fusion across the spine. There are flowing osteophytosis changes. There is widespread facet joint arthropathy and ligamentous calcification changes, as in this case. And CT is sometimes more helpful for diagnosis. And what we see here is marked facet hypertrophy and there is ligament ossification, calcification changes in the joint. And, and the rest of the fibrocartilage part of the joint is all very preserved. It's all completely preserved. So common pitfall, uh, you know, think about it if there is any confusion. Then we look at the degenerative changes. These are I mean, sometimes, typically the onset of symptoms in this patient, they should be less than 45 years of age. But if they are coming in elderly patients, you know, they get pain symptoms, sacroiliac joint symptoms, and we may emit the gym, you know, when we do the image, they may mimic sacroiliac. This is 60 year old patient changes of sclerosis irregularity. But when we do the MRI, most of these changes are centered in the ligamentous part of the joint. And there is osteophytosis covering the ligamentous area uh, of the joint. So elderly patients think about degenerative changes. So coming to the summary, I'm sure a lot of things were already known to you, but most important thing to remember is what we have covered is that there are different diagnostic criteria by various bodies in the world. The most commonly used is the ASAS criteria. What we learned is that on the ASAS criteria, the diagnosis can be made without imaging. When we use imaging for diagnosis, we need one more criteria for diagnosis. So it's very important to remember that the diagnosis is based on laboratory parameters, clinical parameters and imaging parameters. 
imaging cannot be viewed in isolation in these patients. Then we also looked at what constitutes the positive criteria for diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy on MRI. In the sacroiliac joints, we learned that there are signal changes. There should be at least a single area of signal change, one centimeter on size on two slices, or there could be an area of signal change, which is two areas of signal change on a single slice about at least one centimeter in size. And then we looked in the spine, there should be corner changes on at least three different vertebra before we call it positive criteria. Then we looked at the imaging anatomy. We understood the fibrocartilage part and the ligamentous part. And then on MRI, we do the imaging in the coronal oblique plane. We also understood that when we do sacroiliac joint protocol, we have to cover the spine as well. And we also understood that we have to do importantly a fluid you know, a sensitive sequence such as a stir or a T2 fat saturated sequence covering the thoracic and lumbar spine. And last, we look throughout the lecture that we should be able to speak rheumatologist language. We should not work in, you know, in different areas. We, we should be you know, mingling with them, speaking to them, understanding what they, their understanding is. And in your report, you can put as active bone marrow edema, you can put structural changes in. These are terminologies which are very well understood by the rheumatologist. And if in, in your uh, study, if you think the images are indeterminate, they fall in the category which we have already looked. Uh, your changes fall in the category of probably normal, possibly SPA or probably SPA, then say that. And as I've already said, said this is not a single point assessment. If the symptoms are continuing, strong clinical laboratory coral, you know, findings are there, then we may need further imaging at a se separate point of time in future. Thank you all very much. And very quickly, I'll just mention about the two conferences that are coming up. One of them is the Royal College of Radiologists uh, Global Conference, which is coming up in Dubai. And the dates are 29 September to 1st October. And this will be covering all streams of radiology. And the other is the 10th conference of the Musculoskeletal Society of India, which is being held in Delhi from the 19th to the 21st of uh, August. Thank you, thank you all very much. Uh, yeah, that's your, okay. taking us through the entire uh, cyclic joint, almost like an endoscopy, <laughs> looking at the inside of the joint and various pathology. Thank you so much for being with us today. Over to Gaurav. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, so, for such a wonderful lecture. And uh, if you are okay, we have a question from the audience. Uh, yes, sir. sure. Uh, and the member says that thank you for the amazing lecture. Could you explain how to differentiate? between uh, sacroilitis and the degeneration of SI joint uh, on radiograph and MRI? So uh, when we looked at the radiograph, for example, as I said, if the changes are very much in the fibrocartilage part, which is the lower or plain radiograph, so we have the four joints which I showed. If they're in the inferior third of the joint, they are more specific. Then the other thing we have to look at the age of the patient is very important. You know, if the patient's less than 45 years of age, you know, it's very unusual for that to be degenerative changes. So age then look at which part of the joint this is present. And whereas osteoarthritis will be more in the ligamentous part, more in the middle and the upper part, posterior part of the joint, there'll be osteophyte formation. There will be, you know, sclerosis in that part of the joint. And if the age is wrong, 60 year old patient coming with symptoms. By 60 year old patient, if the patient's got spondyloarthropathy changes from young age, they should have fused by now. If they have not been treated, they should have developed florid changes or chronic changes by now. On the MRI, it's similar. You know, you look at the changes, age, everything, which part of the joint is involved. And, and that's, you know, if you have a patient coming, say, 60 years of age, first presentation with back pain, you know, then you look, you know, this is very unusual for them to have changes of sacroiliitis at that point of time. Thank you so much, sir. It was really very informative. Moving on to the next lecture, Sarita, can you have the slide, please? And, uh, next lecture is by Dr. Tamotsu Kamishima. Uh, he's a professor and he's affiliated to the Faculty of Health Science 
Hokkaido University, Japan. He has uh, delivered almost 127 invited lectures in Japan, 29 international lectures, and 110 publications in English language. Uh, his interests lie in quantitative imaging of rheumatoid arthritis. He is the, uh, he is the deputy editor of the Journal of uh, Magnetic Resonance Imaging, JMRI. He is the president of Asian Musculoskeletal Society and is the president of Japanese Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology. We are really thrilled to have you, Tamutsu, Dr. Tamutsu, uh, in today's lecture. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Abal, and also uh, Barprasad, um, uh, moderator of this uh, um, session, and also um, um, AOSL president, Dr. Ho, and chairman of uh, educational committee, Dr. Parao. So I'm very happy to see um, many AMS members um, present um, their lectures for this uh, seminar tonight. Um, so um, to try to keep on the schedule, I'm gonna use my recording. So I'm gonna share uh, my file, just a minute, please. Can you see my files now? Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. My name is Tamotsu Kamishima. I'm from Faculty of Health Sciences, Hokkaido University, Sapporo, Japan. My topic today is MR imaging of RA. Why MRI is scanned for RA and related diseases? With the introduction of biologics to rheumatology clinic practice, sensitive tools are required to monitor disease activity and progression so that the disease suppressing effect of these new agents can be measured. MRI is an imaging modality used by clinicians to assist in decision making and the management of RA. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is also valid for this purpose. Rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, is a chronic inflammatory joint disease with a worldwide prevalence of about 5 per 1,000 adults. The disease affects women two to three times more often than men and occurs at any age. The peak incidence is in the sixth decade. Previously, RA led to disability, inability to work, and increased mortality. The recent improvement in outcomes has been achieved through a better understanding of RA pathophysiology and development of better outcome measures and therapies. Here is 2010 ACR Euler rheumatoid arthritis classification. A diagnosis of RA has to be established by an individual physician in an individual patient based on that patient's features, which may occasionally differ from those represented in classification criteria. Classification criteria are more meant to identify patient for consideration of participation in clinical studies to provide a homogeneous study population. Nevertheless, classification criteria can aid in diagnosis and are often used so in teaching. Again, there is no diagnostic criteria for RA. A system for classification of RA is available. The classification of RA requires presence of at least one clinically swollen joint and at least six of 10 points from a scoring system. Joint involvement based on physical examination or imaging by ultrasound or MRI contributes up to five points as shown in this table. I'm not going too far into standard semi-quantitative MRI analysis, but this scoring system can give us an idea what to look for 
in given images of patients suspected with RA. Joint inflammation, the damage included in Ramris 2016 are listed below. Synovitis, osteitis, bone erosion, teen synovitis, and joint space narrowing. Marked in green and yellow are inflammation damage respectively. Tenosynovitis and joint space narrowing were newly included in the 2016 numbers. As for core set of basic MRI sequences, T1 weighted images before and after IV gadolinium contrast injection that enable visualization in two planes. T2 weighted fat saturated or SDIR images are needed. Okay, let's start with synovitis. Definition of synovitis is above normal enhancement of a thickness greater than the width of the normal synovium. Relevant paper on activity of RA just came out from James Institution last year. These are the images for 52-year-old early early female patient. Final T1-weighted images were utilized for legislation purpose. Labeled synovitis on panel B here, and tenosynovitis, extensor and flexors, were utilized for calculation of mean DCE value, Emax, and E slopes. Representative images from 300 images of DCE images are listed here. Dynamic MRI can be used to visualize activity at a glance by combining MIP technique. The images are obtained in prone position. By the way, you can see a marker on the right hand to confirm the laterality. This patient has synovitis of the wrist, which is dominant in the right side. With this technique, you can appreciate not only large area of synovitis, such as synovitis of MP joint of the right middle finger, but also foci of synovitis like left MP joint of the middle finger and also CM joint of the first finger. These lesions can be confirmed on conventional post gadolinium fat set T1 weighted images. This is a 54 year old female with RA. Again, dynamic MRI can visualize synovitis of the bilateral lists and left MP joint also with tiny enhancement here and there. But please notice that high signal intensity on STIR image of the right ELUJ is not enhanced on post gadrium but that E1 weighted image. This is one of the pitfalls of avoiding. This is 67 year old female without RA. No synovial enhancement is detected. By the way, this tiny nodule is a marker. Of course, you cannot skip 
conventional costly uranium, but that he won't wait an image for confirmation, although I'm not showing the images here. In the same patient, as I showed on the previous slide, you can detect erosion-like lesion in the left scaphoid bone facing radiocarpal joint on T1-weighted image. On STIR, it has high signal intensity, but minimal to no enhancement on post gadrinium fat set T1-weighted image confirm that this is not a bone erosion with pathological significance. This 74-year-old female with RA had strong enhancement in the bilateral wrists. You may notice enhancement in the DIP joint of the left ring finger. This can be seen in RA. By the way, enhancement, other aspect to the MP joint of the left ring finger is not interarticular. But this is interosseous tendon inflammation. There are many known causes for synovitis. Here are some examples of disease which may reveal synovitis. I'm going to speak about a few of these. Let me start with psoriatic arthritis. Between 5 and 40% of people with cutaneous psoriasis develop psoriatic arthritis. Typically present in the upper extremity as oligoarthritis with asymmetric joint affection of the DIP and PIP joints, wrist, MCP, shoulder, and elbow joints in decreasing frequency. Relatively specific signs of psoriatic arthritis are nail changes and the clinical entity of a swollen inflamed visit, that is, dactylitis, often referred to as sausage finger. On the left, typical distribution pattern of hand RA with symmetric, painful, and swollen joints that can affect the three compartments of the wrist and the MCP joint and DIP joint, but rarely the DIP joint. On the right, typical distribution pattern of hand psoriatic arthritis with asymmetric, painful, and swollen joint that can affect the PIP and DIP more rarely the wrist and MCP joints. This is a man in his 50s with psoriasis. Psoriatic spondyloarthritis are reported in 30% of patients with psoriasis, which is characterized by asymmetric oligoarthritis with predominant DIP involvement. Diagnosis depends on clinical evidence of either characteristic skin lesions or nail changes. Characteristic rash commonly precedes joint disease by months or years. This particular patient was quite responsible to anti rheumatic drugs. Here is the MR images of dactylitis in psoriatic spondyloarthritis. Inflammatory changes at digital pulley and tendons suggesting a form of functional encephalitis that helps explain the nature of encephalitis in dactylitis. Encephalitis is characteristic of psoriatic arthritis and explains that diffuse swelling along the digits observed in dactylitis linked to polyencephalitis. This is a 43-year-old male with psoriatic arthritis. Viratal synovitis is seen 
in the list as well as the IP joins. In this case of psoriatic arthritis, 76 year old female, synovitis with edema is seen in the DIP joints of the right middle finger and left index and middle fingers. Goat is the most common arthritis in middle aged men, but can also affect women. It is caused by an accumulation of monosodium urate crystals and soft tissue that generate an inflammatory joint response and progress to a large articular and extra articular tophi that eventually destroy nearby bone and soft tissue if not treated. In the upper extremity, sudden onset of monoarthritis or oligoarthritis of wrist, MCP, and or valgus finger joint in decreasing frequency can be seen causing pain, swelling, and eczema. When the joints are involved, progressive erosions are seen and in classic cases look like punched out erosions with sclerotic borders and overhanging edges. This is 39 year old male gouty arthritis. You can see a bilateral MTP joint inflammation with warmer edema. This is a typical location of gouty arthritis. This is a 54 year old female with gouty arthritis. Gouty arthritis in a female is relatively rare. You can see oligoarthritis with overhanging margin in the first phase of time. Gouty arthritis may present as a non-specific synovitis of a um, finger joint. Sometimes MRI may reveal overhanging margin, which may point a diagnosis of gouty arthritis. The next is osteitis. MRI osteitis or bone marrow edema is a lesion within the trabecular bone with ill-defined margins and signal characteristics consistent with increased water content. As you can see in these panels, Ramirez bone marrow edema is reversible condition which can be cured after proper treatment. Bone marrow edema is a forerunner of bone erosion. As pathology samples often revealing a mixture of increased interstitial fluid, hemorrhage, lymphocytes, and vascularization, as well as necrosis and fibrosis, there has been a shift away from the term marrow edema. This paper introduced the term edema-like marrow signal intensity. Edema-like marrow signal intensity can be caused by known cause or unknown cause. Known or unknown, edema-like marrow signal intensity may be caused by conditions represented as mnemonic of vitamin C's and D's. B for vascular, T for traumatic, A for autoimmune, M for metabolic, I for iatrogenic, N for neoplastic, C for congenital and CRPS, and D for disuse and degenerative. Introducing is a nice paper on differential diagnosis of edema like marrow signal intensity on wrist. This is a case with idiopathic vascular necrosis of the scaphoid or Prizer's disease. This case belongs to type 1 
as diffuse edema-like marrow signal intensity is observed. This is a 54-year-old male with ulnar-sided wrist pain. On STIR image, you can see cystic lesion surrounded by marrow-like signal intensity in the lunate. This is lunate chondral malaysia in the proximal ulnar aspect. This can be mistaken as rheumatoid arthritis. This is the final case for differentiation of edema-like marrow signal intensity. This eight-year female has swelling of the fingers. On FASA T2 weighted coronary image, you can observe multiple edema-like marrow signal intensity in the pharyngeal bones. This is microgeotic disease, first reported in 1970, affecting the fingers of toes of children and causing spindle-shaped swelling and deafness. The cause of microgeotic disease remains unclear. The prognosis is good. In most cases, heal spontaneously without residual deformity or sequela. Moving on to bone erosion. MRI bone erosion is defined as discontinuity of the signal void of cortical bone and loss of normal high signal intensity of bone marrow fat on T1 weighted image. Erosion and synovitis usually coexist. On this post gadolinium facet T1 weighted coronal image, you can see synovial enhancement in the second and third MP joints and rapid post gadolinium enhancement suggests presence of active hypervascularized trans tissue in the erosion. Likewise, erosion and bone marrow edema can coexist. On T1 weighted coronal image, you can see bone erosion in the metacarpal head, which is surrounded by bone marrow edema on STIR coronal image. Here are examples of anatomical pseudo lesions, namely copper bones, CM, and MP joints. Mostly attachment sites of ligaments or tendons. Unfortunately, these incisions are frequently affected by synovitis. Pseudo regions of the scaphoid and cavity on the left and right, respectively. As for mimickers of erosions, when you find the cyst in the lunate, that may be related with infection syndrome, sequela of prior trauma, and Kimbak disease. Intraposseous ganglion cysts are common in younger population with histopathological features identical to those of soft tissue ganglion cysts. Other copper bone cysts may be related with aging. In erosive osteoarthritis, erosions are, by definition, part of process. In IP joints, erosions located centrally at head, slightly lateral from center adjacent base. Location of these erosion with sclerosis along subchondral bone results in gallwing pattern. Gallwing pattern typical of EOA though not a pseudomonic. This is an 81-year-old female RA patient with interosseous synovial cyst. In the metacarpal bone of the left index finger, there is a cystic lesion originated from subchondral bone at the CM joint. Finding usually seen 
in the long-standing RA would be difficult to detect on X-ray with limited clinical significance. Okay, let's start with synovitis. MRI tenosynovitis is peritendinous diffusion and or tenosynovial enhancement, which is seen on axial sequences over three consecutive slices. In the evaluation of MRI tenosynovitis, care should be taken in terms of distribution difference in tendencies and synovial tissue between polymer flexors and those of extensor tendons. MRI detected tenosynovitis as a high sensitivity for early RA according to a recent paper published in ALD. Consecutive patient with early arthritis, more than 1,000 patients from one healthcare region underwent contrast enhanced 1.5 Tesla MRI of hand and foot at diagnosis. MRIs were scored for synovitis and tenosynovitis by two leaders blinded for clinical data. All included patients with ACPA positive RA and ACPA negative RA. The sensitivity of tenosynovitis in RA was 85%. Interosseous tendon inflammation occurs in ACPA positive at risk individuals. It can precede the onset of clinical synovitis. The interosseous tendon inflammation may be important non-synovial extracapsular targets in the development and progression of RA. This is a woman in her 60s. Chief complaint was swelling of the left hand. This patient has negative rheumatoid factor, slightly elevated CLP, and elevated MMP3. You can appreciate subcutaneous tissue swelling or edema on the dorsal aspect of the hand. These findings are characteristic for RF3PE syndrome or remitting seronegative symmetrical synovitis with fitting edema. It has acute onset, benign pulse, rheumatoid factor seronegativity, edema on the dorsum of the hands and feet, symmetric distal synovitis, and flexor tendinitis on the fingers. Typically, men above 60 years of age, with man female ratio of 4 to 1. Dramatic response to low dose steroid is expected. The final item is joint space narrowing. Definition of MR joint space narrowing is reduced joint space width compared to normal which is assessed in a slice perpendicular to the joint surface. In my understanding, MRI joint space narrowing was only incorporated after use of 3T system. The Omerat Ramidis MRI JSN scoring system showed high intra and interreader reliability and high correlation with CT scores of JSN according to the article presented below. This slide actually concludes my talk, but as the president of AMS, let me introduce AMS promotion video clip. Welcome to the Asian Musculoskeletal Society. 
Since 1999, the AMS has brought together radiologists and other specialists interested in musculoskeletal imaging from the Middle East to the Far East. The basis of the AMS is to enhance education, training and research into MSK diseases within the Asian region. The AMS will continue to enrich the quality of education and research activity. As an upcoming event of AMS, the Youth Committee of AMS will hold a lecture on June 25th or next Saturday with wonderful performers from all over Asia. We look forward to your participation. You can find the link to this webinar in the chat box. Thank you very much for your kind attention. That was super wonderful. Yes, and the reference articles. Thank you so much. Over to Bharat. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was really an informative lecture on uh, the amazing aspects of rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, it was really very uh, deep. Uh, we got to learn so much for imaging in RA. Uh, with this, we end our uh, today's webinar. But before uh, we sign off, a uh, gentle yeah. reminder to everybody to fill the feedback form, please. And um, then you can download uh, your certificate of participation. Some of your friends and colleagues who are not able to attend can still access the recorded version, uh, which will be available on the Vidocto platform of AOSR. Um, Before we conclude, uh, let me thank uh, the wonderful faculty, starting from James Griffith, Dr. Abir, Dr. Stephen Van, Dr. Ashwin Lavande from Mumbai, Dr. Gupta from UK, and Dr. Tomatsu from Japan, uh, here with us uh, this Sunday and made this uh, wonderful webinar possible uh, today for AOS. Thank you to uh, all the estimate faculty and I hope to see you in future also. Thank you so much. And I really thank uh, the chair, president of AOS, Dr. Evelyn Ovo, for being there with us throughout the session and uh, encouraging us to do a wonderful webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Evelyn. Thank you, Vana Prasad, sir, for organizing such a wonderful uh, webinar. And it was really very varied, uh, right from the speakers to the topics. We are already getting very much uh, good and positive feedback from all our listeners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can stop the live. Yeah, video. we can conclude, Sarita. Thank you, sir. With your permission, I'm ending the session, sir. Yes. Thank you all. Hey, thank you all. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the Sunday. Yes. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.